Thank you. This is the Municipality of Anchorage Planning and Zoning Commission for October 8th, 2012. Um, it's now in session. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Connie Yoshimura. Here. Bruce Feltz. Here. Stacey Dean. Here. Terry Park. Dana Cruz. Here. Ray Hickel. Here. Peter Mulcahy. Here. James Ferguson. Here. Tyler Robinson. Here. Thank you very much. There are no minutes. Um, we have a, had a request to reorder the agenda. The motion, uh, motion to change the order of the day would be required, and the request is to change case 2012-135, review and recommendation of the MOA six-year fiscal plan, which is not a public hearing, and I would uh, entertain a motion to move that to um, a head of unfinished business and actions of public hearings. May I have a motion? Commissioner Robinson has moved to reorder um, that item. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Dean. So um, what that means is that case 2012-135 will be moved to um, just in front of unfinished business and actions of the public hearing. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, that is so moved. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Pruse, would you be so kind as to do disclosures, please? I was a singer. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. I guess we're uh, looking for uh, disclosures, and uh, we'll start with Commissioner Phelps. No. Commissioner Dean? Yes, I need to disclose for the record I was not present on the September 17th, 2012 meeting and will be abstaining from voting on Resolution 2012-047. And I did have some ex parte contact regarding the Chugach access plan. I did have a former employee contact me and uh, talk to me briefly about the project and his feelings, and I tried to get him off the phone as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Yushimara? Um, yes, I do have a disclosure in the case 2012-120, um, which is the historic preservation plan. I wish to disclose that I live in the South Edition. And for the record, I was not present at the September 10th, uh, 2012 meeting and will be abstaining from voting on resolutions 2012-043 and 2012-046. Thank you. Commissioner Hickel? Yeah, I was uh, not a member of the commission on November 7th, 2011, and will be abstaining from resolution 2011-041. And also, I was not president at the September 10th, 2012, uh, and will not be voting on resolutions 2012-043 and 2012-045. Thank you. Commissioner Mulcahy? Nothing. Commissioner Ferguson? None. Commissioner Robinson? Uh, none, but just a clarification on case 2011 uh, 120, the, the minor amendment that Mr. Hickel just mentioned. I also was not a member of the commission, but that is presented as an amendment to that case and therefore should be able to participate. It's actually a correction to the size of the shed, which was a typographical error in the resolution. Okay, then I will no. be abstaining from right. that as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I will be abstaining from that one also then. Because uh, I wasn't here either. Which which one? 2011 <laughs> All right. Okay. And, and then for the record, I was not president on this uh, September 10th and 17th 
meetings, and so I'll be abstaining from resolutions 2012-043, 2012-045, and 2012-047. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to the consent agenda. Resolutions for approval. Is, uh, may I have a motion? That's been uh, moved for approval by Bruce Phelps and seconded by Commissioner um, Ferguson. Are there any objections to any of these motions? Seeing and hearing none, those, mo those resolutions are approved. Thank you very much. All right, so now we're going to move on to case 2012-135, Review and Recommendations of the Municipality of Anchorage 2013 through 2018 Six-Year Fiscal Plan. This is not a public hearing. Um, may we have a presentation, please? Yes, through the chair. Um, I thought I would do similar to what I've done in past years, which is just to provide you with an overview summary of the document that we've prepared. And then if you have any questions, please ask. Um, as in previous years, what we've done is, is, is we've documented the mayor's uh, strategies, vision, mission, values, and goals. And there were uh, very few, if any, changes to these. These were mostly the same as last year. I think there were a few typos that were corrected. Uh, and then what we do is, is, is we go into the economic trends of the city. We look at what's happened historically as, what, as well as how we see the outlook because this provides the foundation for our fiscal plan. The next part of the report addresses our historical financial trends from a revenue perspective, expenditure perspective. And then this year we added some additional analytics associated with revenues um, as a function of what type of revenue they are, whether it be a tax revenue or a consumer type revenue. And this was done largely this year um, as a result of the large deficit that we were facing in regard to our 2013 budget. Um, we were presenting this information just in case policy makers wanted to explore other avenues of revenues for our city. Um, discuss our fund balance, mostly in regard to how we've restored our fund balance over the years. Um, we now have a fund balance that is viewed upon very favorably by our bond rating agents. Um, and I would like to point out that specifically this year, the mayor and I um, met personally with Standard and & Poor's and & Fitch. And as a result of our meeting, our bond rating was upgraded from a AA to a AA+. Plus which is very significant in this economy because most cities throughout the United States are receiving downgrades, not upgrades. So we're actually really proud of that. Then what we do is, is, is we go into our, our long-term forecasting. And what we did this year is, is we developed two long-term fiscal plans. Plan A is a plan that assumes that the current revenues and the tax cap structure stays as it is today. And Plan B assumes that we tap into a portion of what was previously taxed for schools. And I'll explain a little bit of that here in a minute. But uh, in summary, Plan A assumes a 3% property tax increase over the years. It assumes that our union contracts increase by 5% in year 2014 and that we are able to successfully negotiate our cost increases associated with our union contracts down in 2014 such that our labor increases drop to 3% per year. We assume that the debt that we issue in terms of our bonds is uh, issued in a manner that is less than our principal, such that we can reduce the overall debt to the city over time. And then additionally, we assume an inflation rate of 25 to 3%. Um, plan B is the same as Plan A for all of those assumptions, except for the property tax assumption. And in Plan B, what we do is, is, is we assume that the assembly will utilize some of the excess taxing capacity that is available on the school district side of the tax cap. Now, I want to point out that we do have one tax cap, and there are mill rates associated specifically with the school district. Now, 
due to recent legislation by uh, the state of Alaska legislators, uh, the state of Alaska will be funding a higher portion of um, the education costs in Anchorage. Um, so the school district is not shorted any money as a result of our recommendation to the assembly to tax into this portion of the cap. The state is picking it up. As a result, however, there is additional taxing capacity within the tax cap that can be used to keep the services that we have here at the city at the same level as they are today. Um, the mayor uh, supports maintaining as many of the services today um, into the future, and that is what Plan B recommends. Um, what is really good about both Plan A and Plan B is that we are structurally balanced in a sustainable manner into the future. I don't know if you recall, but in the past, um, when we were looking at these long-term plans, uh, many of our deficits were in the double digits, and now we are down into the single digits and less than five million, which for us is very easy to manage comparative to what we're facing this year, which is a $30 million deficit. So with that, I'll just uh, take any questions. Commissioner Bruce? Uh, yeah, um, I'd just like to make the comment that uh, I, I appreciate the hard work that you, you and your folks and, and the administration have put forward to try to resolve a uh, economic challenge, we'll call it that. And uh, um, for, for, uh, I think presenting two plans is uh, gives some options for the community to, to uh, digest and, and, uh, and then come up with a final recommendation. I think that'll work for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Phelps? Uh, yeah, I'd like to go to the comment that I, I think I heard toward the end of your uh, explanation, and that was you. we have gone from a $31 million deficit to $5 million. So I may have got the terms wrong, but there was a significant reduction. Could you speak to that again, please? Um, yes. In 2013, the budget season that is immediately for us and is in front of the Assembly right now, um, we are facing a $30 million budget deficit. And so we have been working very, very closely with all of our departments to close that deficit. Um, what that deficit means is if we didn't tax into the ASD portion of the cap, it would be a significant reduction in the services to citizens, particularly in the area of police and fire. So what we did was is we, we were able to identify additional funding sources, which is the portion of ASD. And by bringing that in, it reduces our deficits significantly and into the future and maintains the same level of service, mostly. Not in every area, but mostly. Are there other questions? Um, well, I have a couple of questions. Could you elaborate um, just a little bit on um, the requesting funding for Anchorage Water and Waste uh, Water Utility, that's on page 10 under Capital Projects. Perhaps I didn't see what that was actually for. Yeah, I don't have the capital budget in front of me here. Hold on. Okay. What page is that? It's on page 10, under Capital Projects. And maybe it's um, a little in the back of the book, but I just didn't see it. So I'm just wondering what that um, request is for. I'm sorry, I don't see it on page 10. Um, it's page 10, oh, I'm sorry, page 5. It's page 10 of my packet, I'm um, sorry, but page 5 under capital projects.
I don't see it on page five either. I'm sorry. I'm this. Is this, am I not looking at the right thing? Madam Chair. Yes. <clears throat> it's in, not in the capital budget. In in the actual case that we have in in, in the in the six year fiscal program. So oh. so uh, page. Uh, uh, it's got two ten. pages. Page five or page ten of forty three. Yeah. Okay, I, I see what your question is now. Um, historically, when we have gone to the legislature to request grants for projects, we have focused many of those requests on streets and roads and more general government type um, areas as well as the port. Um, but this year, uh, we are going to reach out and seek funding for the uh, wastewater treatment plant in Gurdmud. It um, is undergoing a complete renovation and re rework. And rather than increase the rates to ratepayers, we were hoping that we could get the legislature to fund some of that. Okay. And this would be the first time we've done that. That's why it was pointed out. All right. OK, thank you very much. Um, could you elaborate on what the current uh, sort of business plan is for the Anchorage Community Development Authority? Because um, it says here one of the goals is to advance relationships with um, AEDC, um, visit Anchorage, Anchorage Community Development Authority. I'm a little confused in terms of what its ro role currently is. This is the ACDA role? Or yes. All of, all of yes. Them? Okay. Um, well, well, currently, ACDA performs two primary functions. They manage the parking authority, plus they do have some real estate development activities in their organization. Um, in, in the past, um, the mayor has done some brainstorming about potentially bringing some functions together and creating more centers of excellence, for example, in the real estate area. I mean, the, and these are strictly brainstorming type ideas to be more efficient and to potentially have the community development authority just take on real estate type projects. Um, there isn't anything specific that I'm aware of. It's really just high level conceptual in general. And I'm not intending to be vague, but there isn't anything specific in mind. Okay. So as I read in the um, material, 64% of the revenue for the municipality of Anchorage comes from property tax. Is that correct? That is correct. So I keep holding my breath, um, hoping that at some point in time there will be a seasonal sales tax. Is there any discussion? about that whatsoever to give property tax relief? You know, I am not aware that there is any current discussion in regard to that. Um, the Treasury Department that reports to me has provided financial impact information to Assembly members about this topic over the years. Uh, but every time it comes before the voters, it has not been approved as you are aware. <laughs> Thank you. And as I understand it, um, part of this budget will be based upon a 1.9% increase in total taxable property value. That is correct. For the 2015. Mm -hmm. this is, all right. Does anyone else have any other questions? No other questions? All right, thank you. Um, so this is not a, a public hearing, and this is just simply a review and recommendation uh, to um, the assembly. May I have a motion, please? A motion to approve. Commissioner Phelps. Yeah, so I move um, to approve the capital improvement program as submitted to us by the administration. Uh, it's the six-year fiscal. Six-year fiscal. Yep, thank you. All right, um, it's seconded by uh, Commissioner Pruz. Are there any other um, comments? Any uh, objections? Seeing and hearing none, that uh, 
Motion is approved. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. All right, we are now um, under unfinished business and actions of the public. <laughs> Item number two, Municipality of Anchorage, Project Management Engineering, Context-Sensitive Design Plan for a Public Road. This has been postponed from October 1st, 2012. The public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the commission? Commissioner Phelps. Um, Madam Chairman, I would move to postpone this item to probably November the 19th or possibly earlier. All right. Thank you. It's been seconded by Commissioner Peruse. Can I speak to my motion? Please? Yes, please. Um, this, is, this is a difficult issue. Uh, I don't think there's anybody on the commission that doesn't agree that this is an important improvement. The, the issue that I have and I think the other commission members have is that at this point in time we're not satisfied that all the various possibilities and options have been satisfactorily explored. And so the concept behind this uh, the postponement is for the administration and the engineering firm to work with the community residents and particularly the Rabbit Creek Community Council to deal with the issues that were identified in the letter from the Rabbit Creek Community Council is dated on April, excuse me, April 20th, 2012 and more specifically the issues regarding the speed limit, lighting, and adequate pedestrian crossings. And so it would be my intent through this postponement to direct the administration to deal with these issues and to come back with a recommendation to the commission on each of these. All right. Through the form of a potential variance, is that my understanding? Well, I don't yeah. know exactly how it would come back, actually. Okay. But it's the concept here is you're trying to resolve these issues and you're working with the communities to try and do so. All right, thank you very much. Um, and that motion was seconded by uh, Commissioner Pruse. Commissioner Mulcahy. Uh, back to that. Commissioner Phelps. <clears throat> Is the intent also to include the community council's feedback, not just between the administration and the? Oh, I did, that was included. Now, the idea was to work with the community, uh, community residents, and particularly the Rabbit Creek Community Council. Council, administration, community council. Yes. Commissioner. And the engineering firm, too. Outstanding. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Um, I think, you know, what we had talked about at the work session and previously um, was some frustration. And I just want to, I want to state that, you know, the role of the commission is to really review the context of the road design as it pertains to the particular part of the community that it's, that it's um, identified for. And I think what, what the petitioner on behalf of the municipality has done is come up with a hybrid solution for a roadway, um, notwithstanding the issue of the, the state's reluctance to, to deal with the intersection at the same time. I think that's a little bit of a separate issue that um, we're sort of begrudgingly just getting beyond. But, um, you know, for example, they have decided to provide a sidewalk only on one side of the street because to do it on both sides would be uh, I think overly costly and also add um, uh, add impact to wetlands and a number of other things. And I guess, you know, my, my issue is that we, we were already looking at a hybrid road, um, but the notion that the lighting issue would simply not be supported by the municipal engineer. And so I think, I think you know, what, what I am particularly interested in is to hear directly from the municipal engineer because I don't know that you get, you get anywhere by just having the petitioner go resolve with the Rabbit Creek Community Council. I mean, maybe I was reading between the lines, but um, I believe they represented the, 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 the feedback that they were hearing and the response that we heard was simply, well, it's not supported in our design criteria manu manual and that's not likely to receive a waiver. And so I think that's where, you know, I, I, I don't want to 
cost the municipality money by sending somebody out to resolve something that they have no authority to resolve. I think that's my, you know, my issue here, that, that the real issue is, and I, I was willing to um, approve the design study report with the condition that non-continuous lighting be, you know, that, that a revision of the lighting and the need for uh, less than continuous lighting as along this roadway uh, be honored as a will of the Hillside District Plan in the community. And I, I guess I, I don't know how this petitioner does that working with the community council. Um, so I'd be interested to hear other thoughts on that notion. Well, maybe we should hear from the municipal engineer. And maybe he could come to our next meeting. Uh, Commissioner Bruce. Well, I think I think what what Bruce has put forward with the and with the recommendation and the uh, with what's going on is that it does exactly that. It encourages the municipal representative engineer to get with or municipal uh, representative here to get with the municipal engineer and the community council together to resolve it prior to coming back to us. Now, I notice that that there's three or four top priorities with the community council. What, I, I, don't see a, I don't see a priority list. I would assume that once they all get into a room and they visit and they talk about what they can live with and what they can't live with, um, rather than coming here and using this as the forum to present their arguments, that we eliminate that and that they come to as, as, a, as, as jointly agreed to resolve these three or four issues. That is my hope. Uh, and what I, how I read Bruce's recommendation, that 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 the people that presented it today go back to the engineer, facilitate a meeting with the community, community council, to try to resolve the priorities from both the uh, pm and &E and the engineering department and the community council. You know, I think that's a really good plan. I really, quite frankly, don't know if it's going to work, um, but. What I would say, let's give it a good shot, and if it's not resolved um, by the time for the next meeting, I'd be very interested in hearing someone from the Rabbit Creek Community Council and the municipal engineer come so that we can finally make some sort of decision. I'd like to hear all the arguments, I guess. If we can't, if we can't, if we can't get it, if they can't get it resolved between now and then, and really, quite frankly, I doubt whether or not they can. Well, I think, that, if I can, I think yeah. there's an advantage for, you know, a municipal engineer or any staff person going out and talking to people again, because when you have to talk to people eye to eye, you usually come to a better understanding of the issue. And the other side may also appreciate what you cannot do as well. Right. But frankly, if we just give it to the municipal engineer, I'm very certain what the answer is going to be. Right. I agree. Everybody needs to get in the same room at the same time. Yes. Yeah. All right. And hopefully that's not going to be... Our room. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Did you have something else, Commissioner Bruce? No. Nope. All right. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there an objection? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Thank you very much. See you again. All right. Moving on to item number E3, the Community Development Department Municipality of Anchorage amending the Code of Regulations Planning Department fee increases. May we hear from the petitioner's representative, which I guess is staff. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you heard a presentation from me, and then you also heard a presentation from Linda Brooks, uh, the uh, director of the uh, admin division at the planning or community development department. Um, we were, you did request that Mr. Weaver attend this meeting and unfortunately he's out of town this week, but we did take your questions uh, back to him and he did provide an email, which I, I hope you've all had a chance to read. I did, but not this so with that, I can do my best to answer any further questions uh, you may have. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, and I think everyone did get the email from Mr. Weaver regarding uh, his response to the questions that I had. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Phelps. Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, the second paragraph. And it basically uh, is recommending a 12.5 adjustment. 
and that, that being reasonable, and that's comparing to an overall CPI of 22 percent. Why the 12.5 percent? I believe Ms. Brooks stated that um, that was a number that was considered neither too low nor too high. It was um, in the ballpark of half of the CPI, and I believe it, it was the appropriate number to assist with uh, the budget numbers that were being calculated at the time. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, I just have a comment. I'm not going to fall on my sword over this issue because obviously this is how fees have been calculated for quite some time. I think in this time of fiscal austerity, it would be appropriate for the municipality and the Department of Community Planning to look at alternative uh, types of schedules for this. I've been on this commission for four years now, and the majority of our work, um, aside from the long-range plans, have to do with the rezoning of residential property to commercial property, which is the up, the up, sort of the up, up zoning, so to speak, or the upscaling and the increasing in values. And yet, we can, ch we charge the same fees for a rezone from an R2M or an R3 or an R4 zone to a commercial B3 zone that multiplies the value of that property by three or four times. I was here on the commission when we upzoned up, up the property on Huffman Road from R2M uh, to B3 uh, for the benefit of Walgreens. And after that rezone took place, I was told by at least two different parties possibly three, if my memory serves me correctly, that Walgreens would have pay, happily have paid $250,000 for that rezone like they've done in other communities around the nation. So it pains me to think that you can take a one acre of uh, a residentially zoned property and rezone it to a commercial without the municipality of Anchorage receiving some benefit, especially in this time of austerity um, and fiscal gaps and when we're closing, uh, you know, libraries early and other sorts of things. I really do believe that how these fees are determined needs to be re-evaluated so that there can be some benefit to the planning department and to the municipality. Um, and I'm not sure what that schedule should be or how that ratio should work, but it does seem to me that there is a certain inequity and rigidity in terms of how these fees are calculated. I feel the same way about towers, you know, and I feel the same way about snow dumps, even though there's a conditional use that has to be you know, another fee that's applied every year. Uh, to look at it, to look at simply at these fees by action or by acreage, to me, the municipality is missing an opportunity um, that would benefit the entire community. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Commissioner Mulcahy. Yeah, I just want to say mine. I'm not going to follow my sword. I think we need to move this along to the assembly so they can start considering it. But, uh, yeah, the broad brush, 12.5%. You know, there's really no analysis of what the cost of the services were. It, it, it really, um, yeah, it, I would have expected a little more detail um, support for, for what they're looking for. So disappointing product, but uh, uh, the budget process is moving along, so we need to get our input in. All right. Thank you very much. Any other comments? All right. Um, may I have a motion for approval, please? Commissioner Robinson. Uh, may I have a second? <coughs> Commissioner Hickel. Uh, my motion is in the case of 2012-111, uh, amending AMCR 2120 to increase of fees. I move to approve and recommend the assembly adopt those changes. All right. Thank you. And seconded by Commissioner Hickel. Commissioner Ferguson, did you have a comment? Um, I was 
one going to point out that possibly we should include the, the one um, change that uh, Director Weaver suggested in his memo regarding the antennas? Um, he, he commented that that fee is no longer charged, so we should just get rid of it. And second of all, maybe we should make a comment that we would like the the fee study to reflect the the benefit to the applicant and the cost to the administration or cost to the um, municipality. Maybe that should be um, added to the. I mean, send it up with the recommendation that that those be looked at for future increases. All right. Um, that will be uh, Commissioner Phelps. I guess I'm following up on this, but there are certain types of rezones that take a lot of time and may not necessarily result in a huge increase in value, but are just expend a lot of time. And to a certain degree, there should be a, an ability to capture that, that time back again as well, too. So it's a different take on, you know, the, the way that the structure occurs, but I think that you are trying to recapture as much as possible of those administrative costs. So basically, are you saying that all rezones are not created equally and that, oh, no, they're, yeah. They're a big disparity. And, you know, some things just take a heck of a lot of time and others don't. And so how would you resolve that disparity? Well, I mean, planning department knows generally how much time they spend on various types of rezonings and conditional uses and what have you. And they know where the hard ones are and the easier ones are. And they just kind of figure it out in terms of average time spent. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a motion on the floor that's been moved and seconded to accept the fees. We've also had some further discussion, not necessarily in the terms uh, uh, to the standard of a proposed amendment. So what I would suggest is that um, the secretary record this portion of our discussion uh, verbatim so that it is a matter of, of public record so that when it, and that it be included in um, the uh, recommendation that moves on to the assembly. Are, is there any objection to the motion at this time? All right, seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Thank you. All right, now we're moving on to the regular agenda. Um, under the regular agenda, we have a resolution for approval for case 2011-041, related case 2011-120. This is a housekeeping matter. Um, Ms. Dean, um, did you have a, a minor amendment to the conditional use? All right. Madam Chair? Yes. I move to amend this um, resolution 2011-014. A history of this resolution um, is was previously approved by the commission. It contained an error on the size of the accessory storage building. It should have been a 20 by 30, not a 10 by 30. The application submitted and the commission's approval was by a, for a 20 by 30 storage, storage, accessory storage building. I move to amend the previous adoption of resolution 2011-041 to correct the size of the accessory building to 20 feet by 30 feet. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. May I have a second to that motion, please? This is a housekeeping matter. Yep. Um, thank you, Commissioner Phelps. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Thank you. All right, now we're moving on to a public hearing. And because you weren't there. All right, all right, all right. The procedure by which the public may speak for a public hearing uh, to the commission at its meeting is, one, after the staff presentation is completed, uh, the chair will ask for public testimony on the issue. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules of procedure. Petitioners, 
have 10 minutes, including his or her representatives. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. Representatives of groups, community councils, PTAs, five minutes. If you are the designated representative of a group, please state so at the very beginning so the secretary may accurately time um, your minute, uh, your uh, testimony. Three individuals have three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. An individual may have appeal rights related to any action the Planning and Zoning Commission takes. Appeals must be filed with the clerk's office within 20 days after the Planning and Zoning Commission's final decision. Any individual may request written findings from any commission decision within seven days. May we hear from the petitioner's representative at this time? Ms. Wong. Good evening. Carol Wong with the um, Long Range Planning Section of the Community Development Department. Uh, unfortunately, Christine Bunnell, who is the project manager for the MOA, is stuck in Seattle. She is part of the Alaska Airline cut wired cyber optic snafu that's going on. So I am going to try to pinch it as best I can tonight. But I would like to um, say that for the staff uh, presentation portion, I'm going to be calling upon our consultants who are in town to assist me in that. So together we will cover the staff presentation portion. Um, first of all, um, Ruth, and Rebecca are here to help present, but I just wanted to run through what you received in your packet as well as what was laid down in front of you tonight. Uh, we received very late today a letter from the Anchorage Downtown Partnership um, by, from Chris Schutte who um, wanted to make sure that on behalf of the Downtown Partnership that they were able to express um, their sentiments about the historic preservation plan. And so a copy of that is before you. Um, in your packet, you received a staff memo in which um, Ms. Bennell summarized um, the responses to the questions that the commission raised at the work session held back in September. And so um, they were to address uh, some of the very good questions raised by the commission and as well as um, the memo covers the importance of why this city should have a historic preservation plan and lastly how the historic preservation plan um, should it be adopted will be used in the future. Um, and lastly there is a department recommendation uh, recommending approval of the plan to the commission. Uh, along with that memo were several attachments. Attachment one is a letter of support from the Government Hill Community Council for the plan. Number two were comments that we have received um, on the public hearing draft and we will be preparing responses to those comments um, in issue response um, in your next packet. And the third attachment is about processes and I'm going to let Rebecca touch on the processes that you had raised questions about regarding the plan um, in her presentation. Um, the next attachment is the implementation uh, matrix. Um, you had asked could this be resorted in different time frames and so the consultants have done that in short, intermediate, and long range for you to see how the projects fall out. The fifth uh, attachment is a case study memo. Again, the, the commission asked, could you add some additional case studies that looked at cities that were similar in size to Anchorage? They did and they found two more. Um, one is uh, Little Rock as well as um, Cincinnati, both sim similar in size to Anchorage. And uh, they did, pulled out excerpts uh, as attachment number six of um, Little Rock's MacArthur Park Historic District as well as that city's citywide historic preservation plan. So those are the items that have been included in your memo. So with that I'm going to turn it over to um, Ruth who will walk you through the major elements starting the, the discussion about the major elements of the historic plan. Thank you very much. All right. Um, that was part of the petitioner's 
10 minutes. All right, so this is this was a staff presentation first. All right, and then, and now we have the, cons uh, I don't think so. No, I think this is all part of the staff presentation. All part of the staff presentation because Christine's not here to cover right. it all. Right, and so this is all part of the staff presentation. Yes. All right, very good, thank you. All right, would you please come forward? Thank you. Uh, we have, is there a button that can put, be pushed for the PowerPoint? Is that? All right, we're gonna need a quick break in order to do that. Do you have any handouts? No, we don't. Um, so we've, 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 we're set up here. We were told that there would just be some sort of button to put things up onto the thing. Well, um, oh, wow. yes. well, there we go. Okay. All right. Thank Great. you very much. All right. All Thank right. you. Let's do it. Um, so my name is Ruth Todd. I'm an ar architect and planner and principal of Page and Turnbull. We're a San Francisco-based um, architecture and planning firm focusing on historic preservation and historic contexts. And with me is my colleague, Rebecca Fogel, who was the project manager for this project and is a cultural resources planner in our, in our office in San Francisco. So it's a pleasure to uh, for me or for both of us to be here tonight to present to you the public hearing draft of the uh, Anchorage or the the historic preservation plan for Anchorage's for original neighborhoods. Uh, as you are probably aware, the uh, four original neighborhoods of, of Anchorage are um, Government Hill, Downtown, the South Edition, and Fairview. And this project was put together because the character of those neighborhoods could potentially be impacted by the Knick Arm Crossing project. So a memorandum of understanding was uh, signed by the municipality, the State Historic Preservation Officer, and the um, Federal Highway Administration as part of the Section 106 consultation process for that project. Uh, this project has been going on for almost 12 months. We've been here in all four seasons and we've had a wonderful time in Anchorage working on this, on this plan with a, a very active community group and a very active and highly professional client team. Uh, we began with a, a very interactive public input process. We were from out of town. We came with a set of unbiased eyes to collect information from the citizens of Anchorage, uh, in particular the, the citizens of these four particular neighborhoods and community councils. Uh, we went back and synthesized the input that we received and digested it and filtered it into sort of logical topics to research. Um, um, for best practices nationwide or worldwide that would deal with the issues that we heard from the community. Uh, as part of this process, we also collected all of the different studies and historic resources surveys that have been done over the last probably 30 years here in Anchorage and we summarized that so that now uh, the Muni has all of that information in one consolidated uh, inventory. Uh, and then as part of our research, once we started doing the research for best practices that would deal with the issues that we were hearing from the community, we came back and presented some ideas to uh, through an interactive public workshop and verified from the community what direction to head toward articulating the vision that these four neighborhoods wanted um, in terms of preserving the, the character of those neighborhoods. And the result of that is this public hearing draft. As I mentioned, we had a very active client team. We consulted on an almost monthly basis with a technical advisory committee. We had uh, a series of three public or three public workshops uh, in the communities. We consulted with nine focus groups in, 
including you all as a group, focus group for boards and commissions. Uh, we had uh, information posted on Facebook and social media sites, and in general, we filtered or synthesized more than 1,200 public comments. I'm just going to briefly tell, explain to you what the document looks like. You all have copies of it. We hope that you have, um, have, have looked through it. We know that you did participate in the a workshop on the 17th of uh, last month. Uh, and the, the first part of the document basically just pulls a lot of information together and sets the tone and the framework for the, the meat of the document that comes later in the, in the um, chapters six and seven. But basically it summarizes you know, the, the purpose of the document. It explains the historic context and national, state, and local laws and um, regulations Regulations that govern historic preservation, puts the preservation in Anchorage uh, in the context of what's happening in the past and today in Anchorage, and then as I mentioned, it consolidates all of the historic resources surveys all in one place. The meat of the document is in chapters six and seven. Uh, if you look at the, the flow chart that we have, those 1,200 public comments um, dealt with, that, that we heard could be dealt with on a global scale for all of the four neighborhoods. They were relevant comments that we heard. And then in the individual neighborhoods, there were some very specific issues that each neighborhood felt uh, very strongly about. Uh, and so our chapters got organized into recommendations and policy, policy recommendations that uh, affect the entire plan area, and then followed by a following chapter, Chapter 7, that outlines specific neighborhood-specific goals. Uh, at the end of the document, we have a, a matrix that summarizes all of the policy recommendations that were um, part of the chapters six and seven, and it organizes them in short, medium, and long-term potentials. And then we've included case studies of additional cities to give clues to how implementation might happen or be organized or prioritized here in Anchorage. Uh, I'm going to um, turn the podium over to Rebecca Fogel, who's going to talk about the more specific recommendations that we've had in Chapters 6 and 7. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Rebecca Fogel. I'm the project manager for this project um, with Page and Turnbull. And I'm going to walk you through chapters six and seven, which are sort of the meat of the document where the, the vision and the goals and the recommendations are. Um, so chapter six is the chapter that deals with the entire plan area. So these were recommendations um, that apply to all four neighborhoods. And they're divided into sort of seven modules, and I'm just going to walk you guys briefly through um, the key highlights from each of those modules. So the first first module was is quality of life and livability, and this really talks about um, you know how preservation is is bigger than just buildings. Um, it talks about how preservation goes into um, means in preserving and improving the quality of life um, and the characteristics that make this plan area a uh, enjoyable place to live and to work. So we're looking to reinforce and protect this unique historic character, um, especially the access to trails and open space and recreation, and then incorporate history and culture into everyday life to build a sense of place in these four neighborhoods. The second module is landmarks to save and this is about preserving the character defining features of the plan area what makes these four neighborhoods special and this includes physical landmarks as well as stories landscapes and events and some key recommendations here were to preserve the resources identified in the consolidated inventory and the preservation plan. Um, again, we had an extensive public outreach process and people mentioned a lot of great buildings and stories and places that they are excited to preserve. 
um, and part of that would be nominating these buildings to the National Register and promoting sort of a group of top landmarks uh, in, in these four neighborhoods. Um, and also working with the Alaska Native Peoples community to identify cultural sites, places that are important um, to that community as well. And then encouraging public uses for municipal-owned historic buildings is covered in this chapter. Um, storytelling was a really important part of this historic preservation plan and what we found in talking to people in these communities is telling stories and raising public awareness about the plan area's history, including the cultures and traditions of the Alaska Native peoples, was really, really important to the community. And so we have this chapter dedicated to that. Um, and the first step there really would be to develop an interpretive plan, sort of a, a game plan to coordinate with the centennial celebration to um, talk about how are we going to tell these stories, what are the media going to be. Um, and that really goes a long way towards um, promoting community pride. And there's already a lot of great programs uh, in place in these neighborhoods. There's walking tour kiosks in downtown, um, the Oscar Anderson House, lots of great programs. And so just enhancing and promoting those existing programs, um, again, would go a long way towards uh, promoting community pride. And then collecting oral histories was another big topic. Um, there's Anchorage pioneers and tribal elders who um, have a lot of great information to give. Um, and so prioritizing that sooner rather than later um, is, is a key recommendation in this chapter. Uh, community and partnerships, this is also an important chapter. Um, you know, it, it, it takes a village uh, to do preservation and engaging the community to participate in preservation um, is going to be really essential to make sure that this plan gets implemented. And so this chapter talks about identifying preservation partners and collaborating among a variety of local groups, especially you know groups that might not on the surface seem like, oh, they're a preservation group. But a lot of people, um, especially if you use the sort of expanded definition of preservation that they um, that our plan puts forward, um, there's a lot of people who can contribute to preservation and implementing this, this plan. Um, and just rewarding good stewards of historic resources, people who are doing great things with their historic buildings um, and trying to recognize that um, and looking for funding sources and grant opportunities, um, things to help pay for some of these implementation measures can be found in, in the community. Growth and change um, is sort of a, a big reason that this plan exists in the first place, as Ruth and Carol were mentioning. Um, this sort of came out of uh, the potential Knick Arm Crossing project. And so, so with that, we have this chapter that talks about how to manage growth and change to these historic neighborhoods. You know, that change is going to happen. Um, so thinking smartly about how that happens um, is what this chapter is all about, and adopting relevant policies and projects that support the neighborhood goals and support this neighborhood character. Excuse, um, and excuse me, sure. where are those photos? Where are those photos taken? Sure, the top photo is in Government Hill. Okay, um, and then the bottom photo is the freight uh, freight yeah. depot um, okay. at the in the railroad district. All right, thanks. Um, and those are both sort of new projects that are um, compatible with the historic character of those neighborhoods. Um, really. Hmm. The Those bottom. very contemporary townhomes? They're compatible in scale. Um, they're sort of the same, same scale as the, um, as the other ones. I mean, it's open to debate, <laughs> certainly. But, um, well, that's my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my concern is, is that there are so many things when we get into the design that is subject to debate. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to address the implementation of the design yeah. criteria? I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes. A All few right. slides okay. more. OK. Um, yeah, and just a couple more points about growth and change before we move on. Um, really engaging the community about the Section 106 review process and other review processes. Um, and that also goes towards your point of, of implementation and, and talking about um, you know, how do we look at these designs. Um, really getting the community involved will be, will be essential. Um, economic development is a key 
component of, of any plan, but especially historic preservation plan. Um, and what our plan tries to emphasize is that um, historic preservation and economic development are sometimes seen as sort of opposing forces. Um, but this chapter really talks about you know, providing incentives for historic preservation and fostering a healthy local economy while engaging in preservation activities. Um, and so it recommends offering some new financial and policy incentives, um, as well as promoting existing incentives. There's a lot of things out there already, federal historic preservation tax credits, and a number of other things outlined in the plan um, that exist already that people don't know about. And so just simply spreading the word um, could go a long way. Um, and encouraging heritage tourism as well. Um, one of the things we heard through the public outreach process was that um, people who visit Anchorage are excited about the history and want to learn more. Um, and that can really be a strong economic driver if that is, is fostered. Um, and also looking at developing metrics to quantify the effects of preservation. This is sort of where some of those case studies come in as well. Um, but really, one of the recommendations is to develop metrics that are specific to Anchorage so we can measure going forward. Um, Thank you. We do have a question. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Yeah. Dean. Yes. Through the chair. Um, my question is related to the um, book that we received, not the binder, the binding of the, the plan, but the actual, do you have this? Yes, the staff report? Yes. Yes. I'm looking at page 47. 47. I don't have page 47. You have the full one. Yes. I'm looking at page 47. I'm looking at numbers 7.1 through 7.14 FV. Uh-huh. I see a tremendous amount of government regulation and agencies that will need to be formed in order to make this happen. I would like to know, does, has anybody given any thought at all to how that's going to happen or where the money is going to come from? Seven point one four FV. Seven point one them. through seven point one four FB, the whole column, the whole page. <laughs> this this list was identified through our um, listening to the community and uh, things that they wanted additional follow-up in the future. And yes, we acknowledge that this list does have items that will not be tackled the first year out that this plan is adopted, but that these are um, items that we would want to work with through possibly the Historic Preservation Commission in setting priorities and looking at funding sources to pull together these mechanisms. The community councils that are directly related to each of these items, they will be also um, encouraged to work with the MOA to look for maybe going to the state legislature to ask for funding to implement some of these as well. So it's not going to fall directly on just the city to foot the bill. Because our, we just did look at the CIP, CIB just a moment ago tonight where we were told we were $30 million short for next year. Has anybody discussed this plan with the mayor and said this is the direction that we see the planning department taking the city and these four areas? I mean, how much has the mayor been involved in this process? This is a very major document. This is a major document. This is a historic plan, the first one ever for the city. And it is setting, it's making a statement of whether or not, if, when it's approved, if it is approved, then the city is saying this historic preservation is important to our city. And the recommendations here we are going to focus on working on in the future. So in, with respect to the mayor, we have briefed the city manager on the plan, and so they are aware of this, um, these elements. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm just gonna continue real quickly to just sort of wrap up the presentation and then um, 
Um, and that's sort of a, a good transition here to this um, chapter on procedures and regulation, which was the sort of question that you were um, starting to raise about, um, you know, there, there are some changes that would be required to some um, policies and sort of on the government end of things um, to implement chapters one, uh, sections one through six that I just talked about, um, and talking about procedures for reviewing and permitting. Um, again, these are sort of the policy is to look at a, a procedure for reviewing and permitting. There's still a lot of flexibility as far as what that actually is. That's sort of a next step. Um, and considering historic preservation overlay zoning or historic districts, things to, um, those are tools that are recommended in the plan um, that could be used to ensure that neighborhood character is preserved and also could be used to focus those incentives. If you're in one of those districts, you might have some, um, there might be certain things that, you know, rules that you have to comply with, but you also then would be eligible to receive incentives. So it's, um, and again, the details of all of that would be developed as a next step. Um, and budgeting for historic preservation, there, you know, as you, we were talking about that, that is gonna be an important part of um, making sure this plan gets implemented. Um, and I did want to talk a little bit about the potential design review process. That was a question. I was on the phone last time, so it's nice to be here in person. Um, but uh, I did want to sort of follow up on the potential design review process. This is in your packet um, on page 40, I believe. Yeah, page 40 of your packet. Um, and so it just sort of goes through okay, if, if we do add an additional layer of review to review for historic um, resources, what would sort of the, the steps be? Um, and it sort of goes through historic status, if there's no resources present, if it's new construction but in a historic district, um, alteration of historic resources or demolition, and just sort of provides a just potential sample way that that could play out. Um, there's lots and lots of ways that you could do this, every city does it differently, um, but this is sort of just a, to give you a sense of, of what that process might look like. Um, and as Ruth mentioned, in her part of the presentation, um, the plan is divided, the sort of heart of the plan is in two sections, the entire plan area, which is what I just talked about, and then each neighborhood has you know, each neighborhood is a little bit different and has some specific goals in mind and some specific recommendations that apply in addition to the one, the broad uh, goals. So for the South Edition, they're really interested in preserving walkability, bikeability, access to open space, reducing demolitions of historic buildings, maintaining the historic character of the park strip, and avoiding transportation projects that detract from the historic character of their neighborhood. In Government Hill, residents are excited to maintain a cohesive community and manage the effects of new development. In downtown, uh, we want to preserve the city's most prominent historic buildings and reinforce a commercial and cultural district uh, that's a year-round destination for locals and tourists alike. And in Fairview, Residents want to preserve its diverse character, restore small business corridors, and overcome some of the past land use and transportation decisions, um, and improve walkability and access to downtown. Um, so just going through really quickly a few of the key points for each of the four neighborhoods. In Government Hill, um, top priorities were maintaining historic trails, interpreting the history of Government Hill, uh, revitalizing Government Hill's neighborhood center, um, and this is really dictated by the Government Hill neighborhood plan. We coordinated with them, um, and all of the details about that are in their plan. Um, and continue to survey and document historic resources in the neighborhood. In downtown, um, we want to create a downtown for all, and that really is, um, that's a phrase from the downtown comprehensive plan, and that really um, ties in nicely with um, the historic character of the area. Um, things like updating the existing walking tours and fostering a visually cohesive central business district. Um, these are things that, again, really support the downtown plan and support uh, historic preservation. And promoting incentives, especially in downtown. I talked a little bit about how 
just in general overlay zones or things like that might be able to might be a way to focus incentives but um, especially in downtown we heard from some of the commercial developers and um, property owners there that um, incentives would would really help them out in the south edition um, one of the key recommendations was to develop a south edition neighborhood plan all of the other three neighborhoods have a neighborhood plan that is adopted or somewhere in process um, and a lot of the comments from the south edition um, there's a lot that they need to work out relative to their um, neighborhood character beyond historic preservation um, so that was a key recommendation there and then they have aviation history military history and a lot of other uh, interesting things that happen there and so interpreting um, themes that are special to their neighborhood uh, was also really important and then educating and empowering groups in the South Edition to represent the neighborhood. Uh, they were one of the most, all the neighborhoods were engaged, but the South Edition um, was, was really engaged the whole time. Um, and so making sure that they get involved in development in the future, um, one of their goals was to limit new or widened roads and thoroughfares. And so um, making sure that they have the tools that they need to do that will be important. And again, continue to survey and document resources um, in that neighborhood as well. And in Fairview, um, one of the things that uh, stood apart about Fairview was um, really celebrating its socioeconomic and ethnic diversity. That's been its history for a long time, um, and especially highlighting its African-American heritage. Um, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we probably have people here that um, are wanting to testify, and this staff, our petitioner's presentation has gone on for quite some time so could you sum up briefly sure um, I, I mostly just wanted to finish up with the implementation um, and basically we're at sort of the HPP adoption step um, and we developed this flowchart in response to your guys's comments on um, the last time to really show that um, there are some additional steps that need to happen this is a long-range plan um, timing ranges from immediate things to things that are 10 years down the road. Um, and we lengthen that timeline in response to comments. Um, and prioritizing and budgeting for these tasks um, is sort of the next step that will be led by uh, the Anchorage Historic Preservation Commission. So we just wanted to sort of close the loop on that since that was a, a question that had come up the last time. Um, and again, the matrix is in your packet, so you have that. Um, so I think that, yeah, we can, we're done. Carol. Thank you, we'll just close it here and uh, move on to the public hearing portion. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Wong, before you step back, um, could I ask you where the funding for this um, project came from, this plan? Um, this funding for this plan, as well as the other three planning efforts, were all part of the um, Knick Arm Crossing MOU. And so the MOU was signed by MOA, uh, FHWA, as well as SHPO to develop these four uh, projects in response to mitigation for the Knick Arm Bridge. So um, the four projects include? The Sturt Preservation Plan. Right. Uh, the Government Hill Neighborhood Plan, which you um, heard last week. Right. As well as the South Edition um, Survey. Um, which is just serving the properties and getting them all in one place. And the fourth one is um, the Government Hill Oral History, getting stories from some of the pioneers um, who lived up, who live up there now or have lived there before they're all gone and those stories would be lost. All right, so those, uh, those four projects have been, if I understand it, 100% funded by Kabata. Is that, is that, is that how I understand it? Um, correctly? FHWA state and federal funding, but mostly state funding, yes. Through Kabata? Yes, Kabata is administering those funds. And so um, as we get invoiced, we forward it on to our finance, who forwards it to um, Kabata for payment. And are there, is there any long range? Um, financial understanding other than just the completion of a, a plan? 
Well, for the Government Hill area, um, as they move on to the actual design of the bridge and the crossing in coming through that neighborhood uh, and going through the design context portion, they'll be identifying specific mitigation projects um, to deal with the impacts to that neighborhood. What the Historic Preservation Plan effort has, has done is we've identified that that there may be possibilities of additional properties beyond Government Hill, especially in South Edition, that will, may be impacted as traffic comes off that bridge that need to be considered. So that um, if they address that issue could be additional mitigation. But at this point, um, all we've done through this plan is, is identify the things we have found through our planning process. So there's no long range quote plan for, I guess what I would just call a subsidy, so to speak, for the implement, implementation of these designs, standards, and other items. That responsibility, that financial responsibility would fall to the municipality of Anchorage Municipality, or maybe if we approach with our, along with our community councils, we approach the state to say that, you know, impacts from the bridge project and its um, traffic are beyond Government Hill, and we really feel that these neighborhoods, as identified in the Historic Preservation Plan, would warrant additional mitigation. And so the importance of having this plan adopted by the Assembly, I think, Stand, would be a firm message of this is what we've identified and we need assistance in the future. Thank you. Thank it you. seems like all the solution is to ask the state for more money. All right, thank you very much. Um, the public hearing is now open. Um, is there anyone here who wishes to testify on Case 2012-120, the Municipality of Anchorage Long Range Planning Element of the Comprehensive Plan for Historic Preservation. Is there anyone who wishes to testify? If so, please come forward at this time. Good evening, my name is Bonnie Harris. I am uh, the president of the South Edition Community Council and I am here on behalf of the council. All right, thank you. Um, Could you speak clearly into the microphone? Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. Is Thanks. this better? Yes, much better. Thank you. Um, I want to, the South Edition didn't see, see the letter from the Division of Transportation, Department of Transportation in time to, to have a meeting in order to have a resolution. So I'm going to speak to our response to that letter. Um, South Edition, as you know already, is one of the original neighborhoods, and it's a very unique neighborhood in this town. It's, it's just about the only neighborhood that has streets and boulevards, with those, those patches out front of the streets, that allow a kind of community neighborhood of the, of the type, traditionally in the Midwest, I guess I'd say. Um, South Edition residents are really um, fond of this neighborhood type, I guess I'll say, but not adverse to businesses. We have small pockets of business, city market for one, which is a very popular business. We don't uh, oppose development. We agree that, that it needs more density because that will help keep downtown alive, so we won't end up with a place like small version of Seattle where the downtown closes at night. And we're also connected to the park strip, which is, you know, for the whole whole city. and, and um, we work very closely with the city municipality on the park strip. But addressing the, this seems to be going in and out. Addressing the Department of Transportation's comments, um, the transportation planner who commented said that they oppose um, two provisions in um, the draft plan, and one is, Provision 5.14, which is actually at page 232 and not at page 196, and the other is provision 5.6, which is at page 230. Now, these, these provisions reflect the actual comments of South Edition residents, and not just one resident. If you look through the, the public comment section, you'll see a lot of comments are similar. 
but what's really important to South Addition residents and the community and keeping the continuity of that community is not to have major, huge infrastructure prop roads go through that further separate the community. I think a really good example of how this ruins a, a fine old community is the gamble Inger Corridor and what that did to the older community of Fairview, part of which the residential is still on is on one side and, and another part is on the other and between Ingra and Gamble there's kind of a no persons zone. Um, we have a little bit of that already with uh, C Street and A Street in South Edition and, and it's even marginally with the I and L corridor. We know traffic has to go somewhere. We want good far sighted planning. So in we object or oppose the Department of Transportation's comment that these two provisions should be removed. One, they strongly reflect the South Edition residents, the community council members' views of what's good for that community, what's good for the greater community. Um, the planner who made the comments for DOT said that um, comment 5.14 um, would conflict with the AMATS transportation plan and the 2020 comprehensive plan. Well, that's not the case. It's a policy and implementation strategy. If, if the policy, if it becomes a policy and is implemented as a strategy, at the time of implement, implementation, the, the municipality will take into consideration those existing plans. They're not going to create a plan that's contrary to already existing plans, and that's not the intent of this goal and policy measure. Um, five point, section 5.6, which DOT also opposed, um, it doesn't, that section does not suggest a specific implementation or policy. It refers to the section five goals and policies. And it too allows implementation to happen in an orderly process that's consistent with existing plans and laws. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have much more to say except that South Edition's view is to, to have a sort of orderly development that, that keeps the nature of that neighborhood. Keeps, we're also interested in the nature of Government Hill and, and Fairview um, as neighborhoods um, in, in the way that they feed in to the life of downtown. Thank you very much, but please stay um, at the podium because we have several questions from commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, then Ms. Dean, and then uh, Commissioner Phelps. So, You asked, you talked about orderly um, planning and development. Um, AMATS attempts to do that, and it attempts to do it in a regional basis, which is what transportation needs, is it that. So how do you see AMATS uh, working with this plan? I see this plan working with AMATS. That the intent of this plan is not to change what AMATS is already doing or, or will do in the future. The intent is to be part of the process, the public process. That's what this plan suggests. And I think the public process never goes wrong. It's conducted in an orderly way and it, it ends up with a community that the people who live there like to live in. Well, when you've got the DOT interpreting AMATS, and then you say that they're not interpreting it right. I'm a little confused. No, no, I'm not suggesting they're not interpreting it right. When, when, a, when a law is adopted, or when a new program, I guess I could say, is adopted, it's my understanding that the municipality, or if it's a state program, they look at all the laws that are in existence and the, the, the new implementation, they make so it does not conflict with those existing laws and processes. So I'm not saying that AMATS is wrong. I'm saying that the implementation under this historic plan can be consistent with existing plans like AMATS and the 2020 Comprehensive Plan. It can be done in a way that's consistent, and it will be. Uh, Ms. Dean. Through the chair. Um, did your um, community council discuss 
the design standards that are proposed but not uh, determined by this plan? Um, I, I don't recall us discussing that specifically. If um, I, I, so I, I'd have to say no at this point, though. Okay. We could. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Phelps. Uh, yeah. Did the um, community council go on record as supporting the plan? The community council has not gone, has not made a resolution yet because of the timing of our meetings, um, but. Um, the community council did have two representatives on the technical advisory committee, and those representatives took the community council's um, views over over the 12 month or more like nine month period that the community councils have been actively involved. Maybe it's 12 months, but the community council fed into the TAC representatives into this plan. So it's. Um, a, Having been involved with this for the past nine months or a year, it would be my expectation that that the community council will pass a resolution uh, supporting this plan. Though they may have comments on a a few provisions, that's something that will come out when we take up the resolution. So, do you have any sort of idea of time frame um, uh, for a resolution? Yes. Um, the earliest the resolution could be would be. Um, October 18th, which is the next our next membership meeting, and the farthest out it would be would possibly be this, uh, November 15th, which is the November membership meeting. If for some reason it has to carry forward. Okay, I think it's important from the commission perspective that we get a formal recommendation from the community council on this. We, we will provide you one. Thank you. Um, before I go to Commissioner Robinson, just sort of following up on Commissioner Phelps' comments, um, have any of the community council members received copies of the draft proposal for the historic preservation? Have uh, Christine uh, pr provided them to us at our last meeting, and they're also online. So we, we have a couple of hard copies, and I know a couple of members have emailed me this week asking where they could could see the documents. So our council knows where to get them or has them. All right, thank you. And how many um, people regularly attend your council meeting? Um, between 20 and probably around 20 to 25, and several times a year it'll be you know up to 40, depending on the issues. And what's the general population of the area that your community council represents? I'm sorry, I don't know that. All but right. it's, it's downtown from the inlet to Cordova, from the Park Strip to 15th, and goes on down around the, this side of the lagoon, the north side of the lagoon. Right. right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the the uh, plan summarizes some of the potential historic districts. I think there are maybe four in, in South Edition. Do you, have you as a council discussed whether you think there would be support for residents within those districts to, to um, you know, sort of create those historic districts to vote themselves into a, uh, a, a nationally recognized or locally recognized historic district? Uh, the council has not discussed that. One one of our members, uh, currently our, who is currently our treasurer, lives in one of those districts, and uh, she has expressed at our meetings that she and some of her neighbors are developing the history. It's the Pilots Row, the Army early Army housing, the f built in 1948, um, actually started in before the war, and then all the soldiers were pulled away, and then it it was completed after the war, and and that's a they're interested in looking into uh, at least historic the houses that were built then, and I don't know how how can um, how focused they would be on a district that would be up to them. And when you when you talk about supporting um, things within South Edition, perhaps looking at other places for commercial development or. Um, looking at roads that go through. Are, are you specifically, are you talking about the entire community council or these districts specifically when you're commenting? Um, I, I'm not sure I, I understand your question. We have four little uh, re, um, business zoning areas in our community council and they support very 
very um, nice and appropriate sort of neighborhood businesses, a little bakery, the city market, the, um, the fish company. Um, and then there are some on, on uh, 15th as well, which is a little strip mall. But, but I, I don't hear opposition to those at the meetings, and there is support for them at the meetings. Okay. We like that, what that adds to the neighborhood. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Will the next person please come forward? Hi, my name is Kim Varner Wetzel. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a member of the Anchorage Historic Preservation Commission, um, but our chair is here and she'll give some words about that commission, so I'll just give some separate words as an individual. Um, this, uh, the preservation plan, uh, it's the biggest leap in historic preservation planning um, since the adoption of the Anchorage 2020 Comprehensive Plan. Um, so this is a very important document. Um, it doesn't invent preservation planning, um, but it does tie it to the policies, uh, goals, and visions of our land use laws. Um, so therefore, it provides the authority uh, to implement the strategies that you read in chapter six and seven. Um, Tomorrow I'll be back here for the assembly um, because I'll be reappointed to the Historic Preservation Commission. And I just want you to imagine uh, how satisfying it will be uh, to, to start that new appointment um, having some co codified guidance that guides our activities as a commission you know, for the next 10 years. Um, it'd be kind of like your commission, Planning and Zoning Commission, without having an adopted land use plan map or an adopted comp plan. Uh, you're sort of a commission without uh, that guidance. Um, and I, I'm, I hear some of your concerns about fiscal commitments. Um, and so I totally understand the commission does need to reject certain items. Um, and that's fine. I ask that you simply amend, amend the plan, but don't reject the plan. Um, because the majority, the vast majority of the implementation strategies, um, they're low or no cost. Um, like you heard, the plan itself do not cost the municipality any money. Um, the implementation, they rely on efforts of existing nonprofit groups, or they may adjust some of the administrative activities of the municipality. Um, but it's very cheap, so thanks for your time. Uh, just um, one moment, uh, Ms. Dean. Through the chair, I have a question on the formation of the commission, and is it uh, chartered by the city and um, appointed by the mayor? How does your commission work? I'm really curious. I think you described it accurately, and Michelle, you could uh, state the same. It, we were appointed by an ordinance about four years ago? Six years ago. So I've been in the commission for two years. And uh, so you, you did describe it correctly. So we do have a mission, but the the guiding principles by which we need to point back to is this preservation plan. And so these are the four neighborhoods and eventually the, all of Anchorage will have a preservation plan all encompassed that are a sub plan to the Anchorage's comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would the next person please come forward? Hello, my name is Michelle Ritter. I'm the chair of the Anchorage Historic Preservation Commission. Um, we were part of the, the memorandum of understanding that they were speaking about earlier. We were actually named as one of the advisory boards in that memorandum. Um, and so we would like to commend Paige and Turnbull and staff for the exhaustive amount of effort that they put forth in the plan. Um, as Kim mentioned, we've kind of been a commission without guidance. Um, we have a pretty extensive charter that formed us um, in our resolution and tasked with a lot of, of goals and efforts, but with no guiding document for, to lead us. Um, and so what Paige and Turnbull and staff did was a really big community effort. They had um, many public meetings and workshops. They went to countless community councils, and they really engaged the public. And with that, they have a really good policy that kind of outlines a framework um, and guidance on implementing the strategy um, if the neighborhoods choose to do so. Um, and the importance of the plans is that there is grant funding available, um, and that's another option that some of this can get funded. And so without a plan, it's really hard when the State Historic Preservation Office 
you know, offers $25,000 and, you know, these communities want to, to maybe go the next step and having this policy in, adopted will help them because it will show that there's already the framework established. So with that, the Anchorage Historic Preservation Commission does support um, approval and as Kim said, with, with any um, recommendations, but approval of the plan. Um, thank you very much. Just a small housekeeping matter. I believe Kim has already left, and I, the secretary needs to know how to spell her last name. Do you know how to do that? I do. Thank you. W-E-T-Z-E-L. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Um, Commissioner Robinson has a question, so please stay at the podium. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Um, Michelle, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, wearing your, your other hat in the okay. community as a planner and working for um, often private or public projects that come through. One of the things that the plan um, talks about is uh, potentially having different review processes. And I think the slide documented, you know, coming in front of the Historic Preservation Commission or having some type of review. Um, there's also some language that talks about, um, you know, somehow projects being approved at the community level. Um, but it doesn't put a lot of definition into that. It just sort of lays it out there. And I, I wonder if you could just comment generally on that, both um, as to what you think would be sort of appropriate, what would be workable, and, um, you know, what might put your other self at, at ease knowing that there's good expectations for process. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up because also wearing my other hat, um, that that is a concern because it does talk about um, additional community um, having Native peoples buy-in um, and the community efforts. I think is as a commission and, and as, as a, on the wearing my other hat, I would feel more comfortable if we could streamline it so that if it's a community effort, it would be the same as if you're doing a conditional use permit and you have to go to the community council to get their vote of support that it could all be done under one guise. One of the recommendations of the um, policy is kind of adding a checkbox to your application. So I would hope and think that that could be done under the same, um, same process with the community councils. As far as our review goes, um, I think it could be as simple as us just being another agency, that if that box is checked, that when staff um, gives out the copies to the agencies for review that we would just be part of that review process so we wouldn't be adding any time to it um, and that our co comments would maybe come back to the commission so that you could weigh in on it um, i also would like to see more definitions of that um, time period and also definitions and clarifications on um, some definitions like large-scale development and high density development Thank you. I think those are mine that I'll be bringing up later, and I think that um, I'm sure other members of this body will, will probably have similar questions. Yeah. I, I, I think that what I think I heard you say was, you know, if you have a stated process and it might involve the commission, and then you talked a little bit about the community council, it's still not clear to me. Do, do you think at the real community level there should be um, – there should be uh, a, approval authority of some kind related to a project or just consultation related to whatever process or standards that come up. And, and they're two different things. Um, you know, one is the notion of bringing, a, and, and we all go to community councils and talk about projects, but it's usually to, that they're not, they're not an approving authority. Right. Um, and, and so there's a difference. and. Um, I, I think I understand what you're asking, and no, I don't think it should be a formal approval. I think it should be a consultation process, and after there is a clear strategy in place and true definable implementation and policies that have been adopted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd stay there, uh, Commissioner Ferguson. Uh, on the same issue, certainty is important to a developer, and time is money. You heard the, the woman from um, the South Edition speak. They could not re get back because they had not met. If, if we have to go to a community council and they're not meeting, and some don't meet in the summer, that is a major conflict that causes me a great deal of concern with this process. 
but that's something that we're already challenged with with any other public, public process. Because if we're doing a conditional use pro permit or a rezone, we're still charged with going to the community councils. And we face that, oftentimes I face that, and either have to deal with an executive board or have been postponed for a public. Yeah, but we're expanding that problem with this. And I think ideally, um, and, and maybe I wasn't clear, is that it would be part of the same, that when you met for that consultation, it would be at the same time that you're going to the community council. But we're expanding the number of times you'd have to ha you would have that problem with this process. Because we're talking now about historical properties, and we're talking a lot, of, a lot more properties. And so it, it, it is a much more frequently occurring problem. I'm also concerned with their demolition delay review process. Um, I think we all understand what a total demolition is. But now I want to go in and I want to knock out one wall. Do I now have to go through this demolition delay review or do I, I mean, they, they have not defined that. And um, I believe that that wearing your other hat would be a major challenge there on that issue. And they promised us the demolition delay review does not mean delay also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are other people in the queue, Ms. Dean. Through the chair. Um, it does mention in here that architectural standards and the potential for architectural review. Um, say I owned a house in South Edition and I went ahead and put forth that I wanted to do something to my home. I had to go before your committee or your board, your commission, and get that review. Um, what I found personally in architectural review committees is that the membership changes and it changes every year. And those attitudes and opinions change with that group of people. So. Um, what I've found sometimes is that I apply for something and that particular committee says, no, you can't do that. I wait a year, the next year the person, you know, the groups change and I can do what I want or vice versa has happened to me too. That is, you know, the fuzziness of having an architectural review. Now in commercial, it's a little different, but in residential, it is very personal. How do you guys want to deal with that? What is the plan? Um, I think that that would be something that maybe um, Paige and Turnbull should speak to. Um, I think sort of in just sort of more broadly talking about some of these review processes and um, things, you know, they're, they're not set in stone yet. Um, and the, they're sort of the way that we revised our implementation matrix was hopefully to sort of clarify um, things a little bit that the policies um, are sort of the, the overarching things that would need to be upheld by however you decide that review process goes. Um, but we are being asked to approve a plan that doesn't have definition. That's my personal problem mm -hmm. with your plan is it's not giving me those rules. It's just giving me fuzziness. And I'm opening the door for a whole lot of potential issues for people. And it is very personal when you're messing with somebody's home. And um, all of a sudden you're telling them what they can and can't do with their property. And you know, people have a great deal of investment of time and energy. Yep. So I, 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 I don't understand why we're being presented with a plan that doesn't have definition on those kinds of very serious issues. Certainly, and, and I, I, can, I can certainly see your point, um, and I guess sort of my point is that um, the, the implementation, there is still another step to the implementation, and this is sort of a big picture, long range plan, and some of those details are gonna need to be worked out in the future. Some of those definitions are gonna need to be worked out in the future, and so what we're sort of hoping is that this plan is enough of a direction to say, okay, we are excited about the direction this is going, and we wanna look into these issues more, and you know, try to implement some of these things and, and see how they can work out. And I don't know if you have more 
to, uh, to help answer that. I just want to use a for instance. Um, like the South Edition, there are four potential uh, districts that could be formed. Well, those districts need cannot form just on their own. They have to be self-nominated by the property owners. If they don't get, what is it, 51 percent of people agreeing to be part of that district, the district dies. It does not happen. But say a, there is 51 percent of people there that choose, yes, we want to have a district here, then they would forward that recommendation to still, um, it's a type of zoning, so it would come to this body to be reviewed and you would look at what is it that that particular district is willing to put upon itself in terms of future design, future um, setbacks, whatever. So there's another opportunity for both this commission as well as the historic preservation to weigh in on that decision. So it's, it's just setting a platform for future discussions. Thank you. Um, Carol, if you'd stay at the podium for a minute. Um, I have a question and then uh, Commissioner Ferguson has another question. It's my understanding that we're on some sort of deadline here in, and that this historic preservation plan is uh, part of a requirement for uh, Kabata moving forward. Could you, is that, is that the case um, or what's the situation there? Um, this is part of the Memorandum of Understanding, which has an established deadline of December 2012 for these planning documents to be completed. Um, how they'll be used in the future is that as they, say, design the cut and cover up in Government Hill, they'll look at both the Government Hill plan as well as this historic preservation plan to help um, design and, and con design that cut and cover so that it's sensitive to what the neighborhoods have identified as being important, both historically, uh, walkability, um, the neighborhood center. So those are things that would come forward as they look at how to design that project. But absent those plans, then we're silent on how that cut and cover should go through there. So, um I do sense on the commission a certain amount of concern um, regarding uh, these plans and uh, moving forward, uh, particularly on the historic uh, preservation plan. So what happens if the commission doesn't take any action, immediate, any immediate action? The commission doesn't take any immediate action, then um, the assembly could look at what has been presented in the public hearing and decide if they have enough information that, to either move or um, inform Kabata, I would think, um, that we need additional time. But at this point, we have not received any word that that deadline has been extended. So we have to uh, you know, deal with the, that. That is our deadline to work with. So um, this is a deadline established between the municipality and Kabata, but it doesn't have any impact, any direct impact on any sort of funding is um, just so that I have clarity. Funding in what sense? Uh, uh, any additional funds from the state legislature or the federal government as it relates to Kabata? I think that they would, no, I have not heard anything funding related, but uh, I know that the plans would help inform them taking it to the next step, which is the design build step. Right now they're at 35% design, and they'd like to go to the next step, which is to hire a consulting project team that would design, build the project. And these plans would inform that project team. All right, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Ferguson and then Commissioner Hickel. Breaker for me right there. 
I don't have a problem with reach out. I don't have a problem with community effort. But when you talk about empower local groups through guidance and training, I really feel that uh, we stepped over a line that we shouldn't have stepped over. Okay, well, well, we'll note that. And um, there are some groups that are more active and they know how to access um, our public processes. And there are some groups that are not educated. And so it's a matter of maybe if we could change the wording on that, but it's just trying to uh, make more groups aware of what the public processes are for reviewing projects, for historic preservation, um, and just letting people know um, about those. Guidance and training and effective public comment is, is what raises my, my severe question. And I cannot back it until that has been removed because it just, I, I have no problem with outreach. But once you go to start to training people to, to do the testifying, um, I think, in my opinion, that's inappropriate. Okay, noted. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Hickel and then Commissioner Phelps. Yeah, uh, it is my understanding, and it's, like I said, just my understanding that that uh, Kabata has met their contractual obligations for historic preservation. Could you clear that up? I mean, that, that's my understanding from speaking to one of the board members. And, and if that is not, could we get that clarification either from Kabata or something in writing? Uh, we can ask Kabata for what their um, reading is about um, historic preservation mitigation. Um, but this piece of th this plan, as well as the other three documents, are our obligations uh, when um, Mayor Sullivan signed the MOU and said that, okay, if Kabata pays or FHWA pays for these items, then we will uh, do our part to complete these four items. Yeah, and my question, my question was, uh, has Kabata met their uh, obligations as far as uh, their contractual obligations? And if we did not make a decision, would it slow them down? I was under the impression that it probably wouldn't or it would not, but um, I just, if I could get clarification, um, somehow that'd be great. Okay. Well, All right find that out for you. Thank you. Commissioner Phelps. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at the, um, the list of uh, implementation actions or policies, and I'm concerned about the, the length of that list. Um, who am I talking to, by the way? <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I would introduce myself. I'm Judy Doherty. I'm the Deputy Executive Director with Kabata. Okay. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions regarding Actually, my, my question really is directed at the staff dealing with the historic preservation plan. Right. I was just helping Carol out with the last question. Um. Regarding the contractual obligation? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. The, the, the plans that were discussed, you'll have to excuse my orthodontia. <laughs> But the plans that um, the Muni have been presenting are the mitigation, part of the mitigation for the project. Um, we have given them two years after the rod was signed to complete these plans, and they're on schedule to do that. Um, so yes, they're meeting the contractual, the contractual obligations. We do have some concerns with the plans as they are currently written and we have commented on those. And we would ask that you take into consideration our comments um, with, res with respect to some of the um, enforcement type of language seems pretty strong. So that being said, um, we understand that this process getting through boards and commissions and the assembly is a lengthy one and we have asked the Muni to at least have these plans at a draft stage by the deadline, understanding that they, that time, you know, is, is out of their hands from this point, and they have met that obligation. As far as the content of the plans and how they get carried forward into the project, these plans will be included on our website as reference information documents to the contractor, so he understands the 106 process and how it was how it was completed. Um, we don't intend for these plans to be 
implemented through the project that was not part of the 106 obligations that, that FHWA put on the project. However, a context-sensitive solutions process will be in place that the contractor will be engaging the Community Council and Government Hill, and these plans will help support that, that effort with respect to the elements of the community that are disrupted by the project, um, namely the, the tunnel and the adjacent properties the the park space and and such in the in the neighborhood um thank you very much um commissioner phelps are, do you have some questions of this particular um individual not really no all, all right so um i i have one question and then we have other people in the queue but my question is the request is an element of the comprehensive plan for historic preservation. So whose idea is it to make it an element of the comprehensive plan? Or are, are all plans part of the comprehensive plan? Or is it voluntary or involuntary, so to speak? And um, I'm not sure who should ask that question. But that's how this material was presented to us as an element of the comprehensive plan, which I think is a significant concern. Um, I would have to defer to a municipal employee on that. That wasn't a, re a requirement of the Federal Highway Administration. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Madam so, Chair, I have yes. a question of this. Uh, okay. Let's. Um, um, let's save all that. We we need to finish our public testimony. So, part of the public testimony. Yes, she is. So if you have a question specifically for her regarding the public testimony. The comments you made are in your letter of September 18th of 2012 to the planning department? That the comments you're referring to? Yes. Okay, and that's on page 21 of our packet. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to ask you a question related to the, the one about the comprehensive plan. But it, when you plan for road projects or facility projects through federal highways or, or state highways, um, do you pay more attention to documents that are formally adopted by a municipality than those that are, that are somehow sub not formally adopted as, as a municipality? In other words, are you not required to pay more attention to an element of the municipality's comprehensive plan when, when conducting transportation planning? And I don't care who it, I'm talking about a general question mm -hmm. right now, whether it's a Kabata or a city road or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Well. But I was curious on your, your take on that. Well, um, I'm not a planner, so I may be woefully inadequate to answer that. I, I, I'm an engineer. A project manager and I don't get too involved in the planning process however as a, um, an employee of Kabata I did participate in the in the development of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan with respect to including our project but I don't feel I have the depth of knowledge from the planning perspective to answer your question okay thank you all right thank you Commissioner Hickel do you have a question for this uh, ind individual giving testimony I guess I just wasn't 100% clear if, uh, you know, this is a whopper. I don't know if I can decide on this tonight. Is this being uh, pushed off and not being completed by December? Um, anything? I think this is something that the commission can discuss and ask of staff um, when we close the public hearing. So thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Is there anyone here? Anyone else who wishes to testify, anyone else at all, would you please come forward? Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob French. I'm uh, the president of the Government Hill Community Council. Um, I would like to point out in, the, uh, in your package here that there, the Government Hill Community Council does have a le letter recommending that this be approved. Um, we've been involved in both this process, the neighborhood plan process, the oral history process, all of these 
different plans, and I think that they're a, a real important part towards um, being able to uh, really do some planning to provide this, these guidance documents for the neighborhood. And I would say that it's been my experience that the, the certainly among our neighbors, there were quite a few people who were very concerned about just some of the things that you're talking about. You know, is, the, is a historic district going to be forced on us? Um, what happens if I've got a historic house and I'm in this historic district? Am I going to only am I going to be forced to going into um, and only doing things that are historically accurate with that house? And the answer that we've been told is that no, uh, the historic district has to have the 51 percent of the community in of the people actually residing or having their businesses in that di district for that plan to go or for that district to be approved. Even if you have a historic pr property within that district, the uh, the gu the historic guidance documents that are in the um, the Secretary of the Interior's you know historic preservation, those guidance or those um, the design guidelines and things like that only come into play if you are actually accepting money, federal money, state money to help out in the in the renovation of your property. You could go through and tear down a historic place, a historic house that is in a historic district. You're the owner, you're allowed to do that. It's only when you start taking on some additional funds from somewhere else rather than using your own funds that um, you have to be complying with these these uh, guidelines and they are guidelines so I think that you know there's I think there's some fear that I'm I'm hearing from the Commission in that um, you know this is going to be both very uh, cumbersome and burdensome and also um, expensive to do and I think that what it what it really my understanding of it is that it's and it's an overlay that allows the state or the municipality of Anchorage to say that our historic properties are important and that here is some of the steps that we could take to be able to um, have a, a redevelopment that goes on in a historically accurate way or here's something that could you know here's some options to um, even if, if you're doing an addition onto something, you could still maintain some historic um, portions of a property which would perhaps still qualify for some additional federal funding or for that kind of historic preservation. I think it's a, again, it's a guidance document and it's a guidance document that will help the municipality in in the efforts to make sure that the historic properties that we do have in our city aren't just bulldozed. And I think that, you know, it's, the, I, I'm a firm believer that there are a lot of old places out there that definitely do deserve to be bulldozed. But I also understand that, and I think you could see from the community involvement and the community um, interest in this project that the, um, we do value our historic properties and that this is a, a good way, a good first step in being able to have, um, to make those historic properties a, a vibrant part of our community. So I encourage you to um, go ahead and accept this plan. If, you, if there's uh, clarifications and changes that are necessary, I think we could work with uh, the staff and with the consultants in making sure that that's going to happen, but I think that um, it's a good plan and deserves to go forward to the assembly. Thank you. All right, thank you. There are some questions in the queue. Uh, Commissioner Dean. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, um, can you be a little more specific? You had mentioned that if somebody is in an overlay district that's an architectural historic district, an overlay, that if they wanted to put, say, a new entry on the front of their home, that they would not have to go through the architectural committee if it was not collecting, if the homeowner was not collecting federal or state dollars to do that project? Did I understand that correctly, or? I, I think that's in some of the, um, the, the, the pieces that would still be 
put together as, as far as, as how that plan would be implemented. This is more of the guidance rather than the regulations. So in, in that way, I would say the actual steps that would need to be taken and things like that would be part of, um, I guess, the implementation part for this, these plans. So make sure I understand this right. If I'm willing to go ahead and apply for federal grant money or state grant money in order to put an Arctic entry on my home, say I'm in one of those overlay districts, then I go ahead and have to go before the architectural board in order to, or the commission in order to make sure that I'm following their particular guidelines, whoever those people may be, and they will decide whether I can or not unless I chose to use my own money and not free money, but my own money to go ahead and do what I want. Those are my two choices? That's my understanding. I don't know how much of a gray area there might be in between. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ferguson. Okay, Commissioner Robinson. You, we can come back to you, Commissioner Ferguson. Thank you, um, thank you Madam Chair. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, and again, I, to, to be clear here, there's no overlay district being adopted along with this plan. There's just the notion that an overlay district could be adopted, right? And so in, in Government Hill specifically, the plan calls out, unless I can't see it right, you know, at least three potential areas that are, that are districts. Okay, there's a Quonset hut, there's a West End urban renewal area, and then a, a West End, I think. Anyway. Assuming that there's a process for those districts to become districts, to have a separate zoning overlay that would come back for this, this body, that's fine. I get that. In your opinion, what does this plan do related to the areas not identified as districts or as potential districts within Government Hill? What is the guidance that we take away with this document? Um, I think one of the things is really an awareness. I happen to be in a house which was somehow uh, declared to not be historic, although it was, um, you know, the same age and, every, and the same outward appearances as the other houses around. But I think really what it has done is our entire neighborhood is, has gotten an awful lot of um, really education about the whole historic pro process. Every single house in our entire neighborhood had um, people who came out from, you know, one of these firms, a historic uh, planning firm, to go through and talk to us about the house, what it, you know, what, how old it was, where it fit in with everything else. Um, we've had a real good education process, and I think what it really does is it. I think back to some of the the houses and some of the areas that I've I've lived on Government Hill for 22 years now, and I think that um, I've seen some of the older places disappear, and I I know that um, in, from talking to some of the people who bulldozed down the old place and built the new, they probably would have done something differently if they had known more about you know the, how their house fit into the rest of that of the, the historic properties on our district or on our on Government Hill. So I, I, am I extrapolating too far that you as a community would entertain the notion that even areas outside of the historic districts may be uh, well suited for an overlay district of some kind that would determine, you know, s sort of unique government hill design characteristics. Like you got to build a Quonset hut or something like that. Oh, uh, yeah, we we need more Quonset huts <laughs> up there. Um, no, I, I think I I I don't know whether or not an overlay district for in that kind of sense would happen. But I think that what it, it what has changed it, uh, as a I know that you could have a, a house or, and there are several on a Government Hill which are designed as, or not sorry, they're designated as individually historic properties. And as such, they are still also, if they gain national um, historic status, they are then eligible for individually for additional funds and things like that. And I think that, um, uh, I would like to say, you know, this, this is not changing Title 21. 
It's not going to be something which is changing, um, you know, the other regulations that we have to follow. But I think yes, it, it certainly is, is um, it, it's at least another, uh, I, I guess I still see it just more as an educational process. Right. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, thank you very much. Commissioner Pruz, mm -hmm. do you have a question for this petitioner? I, I, I do. Real quickly. Um, I'm not the petitioner. I'm sorry. Um, for, the, so, for the, yeah, it's, it's getting sorry. long. <laughs> they, they talked about having 51% vote to be in the overlay district. Is that, is that how that works? For in an individual historic district that would be recognized by, what is it, the, yeah, the, the national, is that, National Registry. So, so to get 51 percent, is that, in your mind, 51 percent of the people that vote, 51 percent of the homes, 51 percent of the lots? What, what, what do you consider 51 percent? Or have they told you what 51 percent is? I, I don't know whether or not a, a man on one side and his wife on the other side would have to be would have to split their vote. But my understanding is it's 51 percent of the property, and that would probably be either the property owners, or I, I'm not sure how it would happen if it was a a business that was occupying a property that's oh. owned by somebody else. So I think we'll have um, the petitioner's representative ask that question. But now, just for a minute, more specifically, Commissioner Ferguson, do you have a question for this yeah, individual? Mr. Mr. French commented that this was voluntary. On page 148, create a mechanism for enforcing design guidelines. <laughs> um, that bothers me. And I, I read a lot in this that this is changing Title 21 it's going to modify how Title 21 is applied. I see this as a major undertaking. I don't mind education, sir, but the regulation required in this thing is extremely onerous. Um, and, um, I just want to point that out to you, is I don't believe your comment that it's all voluntary is, is at all correct. I, I believe that the what I was saying is, is how the um, the national bodies recognize what can be done under a historic district or a, a individually historic property. Um, how the plan is written, I think you could, we could be taking that up with um, the, uh, the people who wrote it, Paige and Turnbull. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Mr. French. Nice to see you again. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Anyone else at all? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the commission? I think there are several unresolved questions that need to be answered by staff and the consultant. Um, let's start with uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I think I heard Ms. Wong state at the beginning that um, they would be addressing comments via an issue response at a later date. So I think it was staff's understanding that we would not be taking action here this evening. And I would like to use this time while we have the consultants in front of us to flush out whatever other idea questions that we have. Um, you know, the evening is still young, if you will, um, unfortunately. Um, but at least go through some. And I have a couple of big ones that I'd like to start with, if I may. Um, first of all, just uh, to... Uh, 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 I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, I have four people in the queue, and I know that we're, this is going to be a lengthy discussion, and, and I've had two requests for a brief break. Can we do that? Absolutely. All right, great. Thanks. We'll be back in like seven minutes. Okay, we're back in session. We have four commissioners in the queue, and it looks like we're going to have a fairly good discussion. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I think the, a, a lot of the concern that I'm hearing has to do with what this, co what this plan actually adopts in terms of design regulations 
setbacks, large covered garages or not covered garages, all the stuff that is very specifically talking about design, and frankly is quite a departure even from the example that's included in the packet, which are the design guidelines I think you included from Little Rock maybe, where the language is this should consider this and should, it's very just kind of if you were doing what was right for historic preservation you might consider this stuff. It's very different from a codified change. Please set this, the record straight that once this, if we were to adopt this plan as is tonight, what, 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 what dimensional standards would actually be enforceable by the municipality? What overlay districts? Would I be able to build a garage, a parking structure in South Edition? Please explain to me what this does from a code standpoint as is. And what would have to be further amended through another action um, by this body? If this Am I on? Hello? Um, if this plan is approved by the assembly, say, next week, those recommendations in there will require further work. There is no um, overlay historic overlay districts on the book as of today. There is no um, design guidelines for historic architectural design. Those would be further work that would um, be implementation of this plan. And because they would be amending Title 21, it would come back oh. through this body for review and recommendation as well. So what you're saying is that these may, these may very well be specific criteria, design guidelines, code changes that come further forward from different neighborhoods, from different parts of neighborhoods, but none of that comes forward with this document. Thank you. Is any, I, I'm going to leave that to the rest of the group to perhaps expound on that. Commissioner Pruz. Yeah, I, I need the, the explanation of 51%. I can take care of that one. Um, so 51% is to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It applies the same way across the country. Um, it's 51%, I believe, of the legal property owners. So whoever is on record as the legal property owners for however the parcels are divided, 51% um, of those property owners must agree. Okay, so you think that. Is, can you, would you be opposed for that to be spelled out? Because in, no, most, that, in most elections, it's 51% of the people that vote. So this is a little bit different. This is this would be like saying 51% of all Anchorage residents would have to vote. And when you say 51% of the, of the legal property owners, okay, one vote, one parcel. And uh, uh, so if there's 100 parcels and 20 people vote, and 19 vote for it, and one votes against it, against it, it fails. If there's 20 properties in the district. No, there's 100 parcels, and only 20 vote, and 19 vote for it, and one votes against it, they don't get the 51% or 51 parcels. Is that correct? Which is different than an, an elect, a normal election. I guess I'm maybe not understanding your example. To be designated as a historic district on the National Register of Historic Places requires the consent of 51% of the property owners in that district. Okay. And a property owner is defined as? The person whose name is on the deed for that property. For that parcel. And then what happens if there's more than one person's on the deed? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think it, that's a question for the National Park Service, um, but that's a federal regulation. Yeah, there's no flexibility in, in how a historic district can be designated on the National Register. Now, if someone wanted to have a local historic district, then the rules are set however the local jurisdiction wants to 
wants to set that. But it can't be on the National Register of Historic Places without 51% of the owners. So I would imagine if two people are co-owners of a property, they would each have a vote, but it would only count once. So they would, if they, they could cancel the, each other out if they disagreed. So that would essentially be a no vote? A zero or, yeah. A no vote. Or, or zero, not don't count. No, I, I don't know. It I is, re the, right. the regulations state it. I don't know the de that level of detail. Well, I just, I'm curious because when, when, when you say 51%, that a lot of people have different interpretations of what 51% is. Yeah. And of what? No, well, and this one is clear. Um, we, can, we can try to look it up and find a, where that would it's be defined great. for you. That, um, that would be great. I, I, clearly, we're not, you know, talking about it the same way. Yeah, to uh, to me, the, the more clarity in the, in the body of the document, the better. Okay, I think we do have it in the document, but we can we can go to that next level of clarification. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on, on um, you mentioned something that, you know, you have the National Historic Register for these districts, but then you can have a local historic district, and those roles are undefined at this time. Is that correct? That is correct. So who would define those roles? The local jurisdiction. Which would be the assembly? Yes. Would it would likely, the it would roles, likely, pardon? Would define, the assembly would define the roles for the creation of how to, for how to create a local historic district? Well, one would assume it would be, it would be initiated by the Historic Preservation Commission who would make recommendations to the assembly who would then uh, adopt or amend those policies. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Phelps. Um, this is kind of following up on the, a lot of the underlying tone of the commission comments. I think we're all concerned about what exactly is the purpose of the plan, what is the application of the plan, what are the constraints on application of the plan, what are the principal recommendations, and how is it going to be implemented? Those are the basic questions I have. Um, and would, I would feel a lot better if, in fact, those questions were addressed up front so we can easily read them and everybody understands the basic structure and framework of the plan itself. Because right now, we have to go through all these various aspects to figure it out. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I, I could answer all of the questions that you just had. I don't remember them all, uh, but the, we, what, we, what could happen is the introduction and the purpose of the plan document. Uh, it, at the very beginning of the plan, there it, it outlines the purpose, uh, and that could be articulated a little bit more clearly. Um, the the our. Um, in our words, that the, the purpose of the plan is as a result, it's, it's an implementation mechanism from Anchorage 2020, which specifically said create a, a historic preservation element uh, of the comprehensive plan. So this was the Muni's way of getting that element um, developed. Well, that's actually a result. That's not the purpose of the plan. Well, it is a purpose, but as it is applied to this specific area, the purpose of the plan is to provide guidance in historic preservation decision making inside those geographic areas, right? Correct. Yeah. I guess um, what I'm trying to say here is that we, we need to come to a very clear statement or statements about some of these basic issues. And it's I think it's easier just to have it up front and in the beginning of the plan. So you don't have to read all the way through it to kind of figure it out. My understanding of the situation is that in as it relates to the design aspects and Title 21 issues, you have a series of potential strategies. And then what you're recommending is that those strategies be potentially eva be evaluated and, if applicable, incorporated into the code going through a particular process. That needs to be clarified. Um, the, the plan in terms of its application in terms of an individual is either of two forms, as I understand it, either you're forming a district and you're going, by the way, I'm not a historic preservation planner, so I'm not using all the right terms, but you're forming a district and that's the particular way that that is implemented. 
The other aspect of it is an individual wanting to do interior design on their house. And that's the clarification we need to have. Does, is a person like that affected by this plan? So we want to know how, what it does not affect as well as what it affects. Okay? We want to know both sides of that particular issue. Um, and then I would strongly suggest too that you go through this implementation matrix and frankly, um, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, some of the stuff I frankly don't think applies. And some of the stuff, like for example, the recommendation to recreate the coastal zone, we just got through a referendum on that. I don't really think you want to carry that as a recommendation. Mm -hmm. That would be an example where I think you really need to go back and look at these recommendations more carefully and take the ones out that don't make a lot of sense. Okay. I can help you if you want. Okay. <laughs> the point here is that I think that you want to go back and kind of scour this matrix and get the stuff out that really is not going to happen or does not make a lot of sense. Or another way of approaching it, and this is maybe a better way, is to, you've identified it by time frame now, why don't you subset that into priorities, first, second, third priorities. What, we're trying to, what I'm trying to get at is, what do we have to do to effectuate this plan, and what's most important to get done, and what specifically is that? Because right now, I can't get that sense by looking at this implementation matrix. The implementation is actually the next step. Um, we as consultants can't say what should or should not be implemented. It needs to be done by the, a local group of people. Uh, preferably there would be, the, preferably the technical advisory committee would morph, or the HPC would morph into the implementation group that would then take this implementation matrix and do as you said and say, this really doesn't apply anymore. It didn't show up as a comment in the public process. So the consultant couldn't make you know, a value judgment. But now that we're focusing on implementation, um, let's tackle this page by page and prioritize and throw right. out implementations okay, that, so that don't work. I didn't get that. Yeah, got, it is a working document. It is so. not our scope to move forward with implementation. All we've done is report out from what we heard through the public um, a direction. And then this document gets picked up by a group of people um, that move forward with implementation and they do that exercise. And it could be facilitated by city staff, it could be facilitated by, facilitated by a consultant, or it could be done by a group of volunteers that self-manage. Okay, I think you need to clarify this because when I was looking at this, I was looking at these are the recommendations from the plan. In fact, that's not exactly the case. These are recommendations tenderly identified in the plan that require further work and refinement, correct? Correct. Everything in the plan is a suggestion that needs to be picked up and implemented at the local level. And if that's the case, if it's really a suggestion, put that in the very front for clarity purposes. Okay, we, we feel that we've done that, but obviously we're too close to the situation and we can go back and scrub, especially the introductory language. And Rebecca is chomping at the bit to say something, so I'm gonna give her the. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we sort of heard this comment from you all um, in, in September, we sort of started talking about implementation and what does this really mean. And so we developed this flowchart, um, which is in your packet, page 39 of your packet. And this really outlines that implementation process that Ruth was talking about of sort of those those next steps, completing sort of a worksheet of prioritization, trying to figure out, okay, let's really look at each of these. What is the budget gonna be? When's it gonna happen? Is it really possible? Is it a high priority? Um, and so this, the intention is that this would be added as a graphic um, into the final version of the plan. And, and its purpose was to just help to provide a starting point for how to tackle these implementation measures uh, because you can prioritize them in multiple, multiple ways, whether it's time-based or funding-based or, um, you know, community acceptance based you can you can there are numerous ways to, to prioritize the implementation and that has to be dealt with on the local level thank you very much Commissioner Ferguson um, I'd like to carry on one point from Commissioner Phelps you talk about going through and scrubbing the list 
I would strongly encourage you to go through and only keep the critical items, the ones that are really important to you. You've got a lot of surplus baggage in here, a tremendous amount that doesn't help your plan and find, help, causes us reasons to reject it. And I would encourage you to put down the, the critical ones. I've got eight points, maybe less than eight points. Um, on page 122, I mentioned earlier the Empower Local Groups. That really sets me off, and um, I've made that point. Um, on page 135, create a Municipal Economic Development Office. You heard us talk about a $31 million shortfall earlier. I do not think we need to be creating another department. I think if you, this plan is going to go forward, you need to work within the existing framework and figure out how to do it that way. It, co it comes back creating an economic development office, you'll lose my vote right away. I mean, I, w I want this plan to work, but I've got to be able to afford it. Page 143. Add a historic preservation review, amend acreage municipal code to allow design review of proposed projects, enact a demolition review. Really, I see added bureaucracy, added layers of government that I don't think we need. On page 142, hire or assign a dedicated municipality preservation officer who meets the Secretary of the Interior's professional qualification standards. That sounds awfully expensive. I'd like to see you try to figure a way to do it with the existing staff. Next thing, we, we do this person, and then that person goes on vacation, so we now need two people, and now we need a secretary, and, and we end up with bureaucratic growth. And I don't believe that our historical district generates that kind of, of action that we need those people. And I'd like to know what qualifications the Secretary of the Interior speaks to that are so important that we need them. I mean, it really is. Um, we can answer the, that question of, about the, what those qualifications mean, if you'd like. Do we need them? It, it's, the, it's the sort of national standard for preservation professionals, so that is it, what it, we're recommending. Yeah, it's just part of a job description. You need Maybe to have... Ten years down the road, we might need that person, but I don't know if we need them today. Um, and I guess on 151, fund and grow the Historic Preservation General Program at the Municipality of Anchorage through an annual allocation of the general fund. We're looking at a $31 million shortfall, and you are talking about going to the general fund for more money for a program that doesn't currently exist causes me some, some question. Two more points. I think the um, AMAT, or no, the, um, the letter from Kabata makes a lot of very good points. I'd like to see them addressed. It, it made a lot of sense to me on it. And also the letter from DOT made a lot of sense and carried a lot of points. And, and if, if we're going to make this thing work, we've got to be able to address those. And, um, you know, I guess that, that is all. All right. Thank you. Before, um, we have two other commissioners in the queue, but um, I just want to clarify something after speaking with Ms. Wong. Um, the planning department is not expecting us to vote on this plan this evening, um, but this is really um, what I would consider an extended conversation so that um, we, the commissioners can raise all of the concerns that they have um, about this plan, and then this plan will come back to us with an issue response. Um, and that date, Carol, is November when? 19th. November 19th. So, um, Ms. Dean. 
through the chair. Um, I have a fair, thing, fair amount of things to say, but I don't want to go on too far, so cut me off if I That's quite all right. keep going. Um, but one of the things I'd like to direct my comments towards uh, the designers of the plan is that one of the things we need to remember in Anchorage, we are a DIY community. We've always been a DIY community. Even today, over 25% of our homes are still built by owner builders. We are the people. And when you turn around and expect all these additional things from people that have no idea, if you ask the average person in Anchorage what their zoning is, what their lot size is, what their setbacks are, 95% of the people you talk to would have no clue. Ask somebody what an as-built is, they look at you just blank. They have no idea. I am a remodeling contractor. That's all I do, remodels and additions. I work in these neighborhoods. I have for many years. And I don't think you guys really realize the additional costs that you're going to put on people. What you're going to do is employ a group of people that are architects and planners that get together and put plans together for people to make their addition happen, their Arctic entry happen, their new facade they want to put on their home happen, or their business they want to do something to. And you're, you're creating a whole industry, essentially, and a bureaucracy to, in order to run that industry. You're going to add anywhere from 60 to 90 days onto the process of somebody putting an Arctic entry onto a home. That's additional costs and time that people don't have. Right now, Anchorage, we just did a housing study. We, our costs on average are 37% higher than the national average for, for new construction. So now you're taking and adding so much more, another level of costs. I don't think it's fair to homeowners. The other issue too is you're working on some of the most expensive properties. And they're expensive because they're old. They were in many cases very poorly built. The barge came once a month. People use the materials that they had. When you open up a wall in this town, you never know what you're going to find. You know, I worked on the, one of the oldest properties in Anchorage. It was built in 1921. It's at 106 F Street. It was built by the Cuddy family. They own First National Bank of Alaska. The foundation is cans of kerosene cans that were filled with concrete and stacked in place. That's the foundation. The rebar is railroad steel. <laughs> the bars, that is what's holding the house together. Now, what architectural element of that do you find to be um, that you want to repeat or you want to reuse that shows some type of a neighborhood feel? I, I, I don't see it. You're dealing with things that just happened. And Anchorage needs to continue to just happen and to evolve the way that it is now. And it's really hard when people come from outside and really don't understand these things. And they tell us that's how things should be. You've talked to a select group of people that may or may know, not know these other issues. I'm not totally sure exactly who's been involved in these committees. But it's scary because you've got a small group of people making the decisions for a large group of people that may or may not understand the implications of those decisions. I, I, I could go on and I won't. Thank you. I would just like to respond to your comments because I don't believe there's any, I don't think you can point to a place in the preservation plan that mandates any of those um, burdens that you just described. This preservation plan has suggestions um, and provides guidance that leads to decisions at the local level. So those arguments have to happen in the future once this plan is adopted. But there is going to be an architectural commission, potentially, if you're one of those consider. overlay districts. It says consider, and it can be rejected. But if you're in one of those architectural districts, there is the potential that the rules could change. And that and is what we heard from the members of the community. Um, there are members of the community. There, there are members me. of the Excuse community me. that want Excuse regulation. Me. Excuse me. Now you are also hearing from members of the community. So I would ask that you re respect all of the commissioners comments. So thank you very much. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, 
again, I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. I think there's a, there's a lot of um, positive steps forward for Anchorage. There's actually a lot of interesting information. I learned a lot by reading the plan. It is substantial, right? I mean, and, and maybe it's substantial because there are four neighborhoods and you had to wrap all of that in. But it's a big document to get through. It's a big document for a decision-making body. It's no doubt a big document that the assembly is going to have to wrestle with as well. So our job is to help, help, help with that before it gets to them. I think the issues that, um, in addition to really clarifying a lot of things that Mr. Phelps said and that other folks have, have said here tonight, the thing that really I want to focus in on are these areas outside of the, dis the, the districts themselves. When I read some of the you know, neighborhood-specific goals, you know, increase walkability and trails and pedestrian connections. And, and I read that to mean not just within the historic districts, but within those neighborhoods generally. When I hear about covered parking, it doesn't, it doesn't actually, it doesn't read that it's in a district specifically. It reads that it, it applies to the whole district. And I think that's where I, that's where you kind of lose me a little bit. That those are things that might be very good planning objectives. And you've just done a lot of advanced work for whatever neighborhood planning effort or update to a comp plan that happens. I don't know that it's applicable to a historic preservation plan. I think it, I think it distracts, frankly. I get it when it's, when there are characteristics that define, help define the portions of that neighborhood that are historic. Mm -hmm. But I do think it distracts, and, and I, when I want to think about the applicability of this plan moving forward, I can't tell whether it deals with the entire Fairview Community Council, some subset of the Community Council, or maybe some subset should there be further action that actually makes those districts historic. So that's what I'm struggling with. And I, and I can go through, you know, as I go through, there are, you know, things like create lead standards within the four original neighborhoods. Really? I mean, sure, that could be a good thing, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with historic preservation planning. Those are the things that I think distract from, from the document, and those are the things that I think um, we're a little bit frustrated with because it's, it, they're, they're very long. I appreciate your jobs as consultants to just put everything out that you both heard and thought might work. Uh, I think what we're going to struggle with in a, in a time frame is figuring out how the heck to narrow that down. And so I, 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 would, I would also, I, I, I'm, I'm looking to staff, I'm looking to you, I'm, obviously all of us can go through, but we need some help narrowing this thing down so that it sticks to really what the main purpose of this document is set up to be. Yep. We've actually been doing a lot of historic preser preservation plans recently, and we've been quite surprised that when we, when we host these public meetings for historic preservation planning, what it really comes down to, what the community really wants to talk about, is quality of life and livability, and they can't really separate that from the historic character of their neighborhoods. And what we find is, in general, the majority of the public comments deal with other than pure preservation issues, um, primarily transportation related issues. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to filter those out when preservation and quality of life are, um, have become so, so linked. Um, I, I get it, but, but our job is to filter because mm -hmm. otherwise we're dealing with something that isn't going to happen and it doesn't serve any of us to do that here. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Mulcahy. Thanks. Um, your case study, I think you had the Little Rock, and that was an implementation plan of three pages. Uh, you referenced Juno, and the, the Juno is for specifically the historic district overlay and its design standards. Uh, was it Cincinnati? Uh, there's no implementation. It's just some general guidelines that, that I can find. Uh, in, in this implementation, we talk about ethnic diversity, coastal management plans, uh, climate responsive building, uh, lead uh, standards for auxiliary dwelling units, uh, reestablishing setback standards, street lighting, education programs, training programs, storytelling. We establish commissions, we establish committees, we establish task forces. I know it's your opinion, and I think Carol agrees, and some members of this committee agree that this is just a guideline and a suggestion. But I'll tell you, the reality is that once this becomes, once this passes and it becomes part of the comp plan, it becomes a weapon that comes back to us that well, you approve this, it's in the comp plan, you have to be compliant with. And we will be living with all 25 pages, what is it, 150 something recommendations in here, we will be having to fight with forever. That will be there. That's the reality. 
So the, this thing needs to scope in on historic preservation and not redesign, re-engineer Anchorage. Thank you very much. I think um, you've heard from all the members of the commission regarding this matter, which is um, very controversial. And I think uh, Commissioner Phelps, well, everyone that has spoken has uh, voiced uh, their concerns, which are considerable, regarding this. The only thing that I would like to say as a residential land developer, I think it's one thing to create rules for undeveloped property. And those rules are, uh, when someone buys the property, they know what those rules are because there's a declaration and there are covenants, codes, and restrictions. What we're trying to accomplish here is putting rules and regulations and design guidelines on top of properties that have been in existence for 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years. That is a very controversial thing to do um, and a very, very difficult thing to do for a neighborhood. Now, I will tell you that I happen to live in the South Edition and I can see on my street there is a wide variety, and I even think there may be even a house that might qualify for historic preservation. But I can tell you from, from just walking up and down my street that you're going to have a lot of controversy, and that my street that I live on will be torn apart by a vote if that is, you know, for a, an historic preservation district or um, whether it goes on the National Register or whether it goes, you know, through some rules and regulations on a local, on a local historic preservation. We have homes without garages. We have homes with carports. We have homes that, um, have driveways from the street. And we have homes, um, with driveways without um, uh, that are on the back of the lot that are in an alley. We have paved alleys. We have unpaved alleys. We have fences in front yards that do not comply. We have chickens uh, in a front yard that do not comply. Okay? So we have new houses with chickens, and on the same street we have a house available that could qualify for historic preservation. So you try to impose those rules and, the, and new rules and new regulations on that street. And I will tell you on an emotional basis and social basis, you are going to tear neighborhoods apart. Because you are going to, and I, I see you nodding your head so that you know that the, what you're dealing with here is extraordinarily controversial. And I don't know when Little Rock was created. I don't know when Cincinnati was created. Cincinnati, I'm sure, is a very old, much older community. But this community was built after World War II, basically, when the railroad came to town and went all the way down to Seward. That's when development started to happen in this, in this community. So whether it's ready for historic preservation or not, I'm not sure. It seems to me that we are, that we're having to deal with this issue for the benefit of Kabata because Kabata uh, requires it as part of their mitigation plan. But whether or not we're ready to deal with it as a community or not, I'm not so certain. So are there other comments from commissioners at this particular point in time? Um, mm -hmm. I would entertain a motion. Do we need a motion to postpone until uh, November 19th? Yes, we do. Uh, but first, uh, Commissioner Phelps. Yeah, I just want to uh, ensure that we have the capability of sending in emails to the uh, staff that can then provide to the consultant because I have a number of recommendations or observations I'd like to make and do it in email form. All right, yes. Um, and what I would suggest, because all of the commissioners have participated um, with their comments, that if you as an individual commissioner uh, have comments and questions that you want to direct to uh, the consultant and staff, that um, our policy is to email all of the commissioners 
um, in a group so that we all have access to the same information. So if we could do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Now, Commissioner Ferguson, you've made a motion to postpone? Uh, it's the 19th. Um, we're not working on Sunday. Okay. May I have a second? Thank you, Commissioner Phelps. It's been moved and seconded uh, to postpone uh, any decision until November 19th. Is there any objection? Commissioner Perus. Just for the record, I will not be here for that meeting. Okay. Are there other commissioners that are going to be absent? Ms. Wong? I just wanted to um, see if we could get the comments from the commission um, in two weeks so that we have a chance to see all of the comments and then work on them and get them back to you prior to the meeting on the 19th. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like all the commissioners will be here except Commissioner Pruz. Um, we'll appreciate any comments that you might make uh, prior to that time. All right. Um, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, um, we've had another request, and uh, that request is to uh, move the Chukach access plan from November 5th to uh, November 19th as well. Um, this has come from a commissioner, uh, Commissioner Phelps, um, I think, uh, would like to be present. He's not going to be here on November 5th. Um, he has a lot of knowledge about the Chugach Alaska plan. I think his input is important. Um, could I have a motion? Uh, I don't have anything on my screen. Um, Madam Secretary? Switch to on the floor. On the floor. All right. Okay. Commissioner Ferguson? Uh, November 19th. Yeah, that's a wonderful night. Yeah. Did I tell you I wasn't going to be here for that day? Yeah, right, right. Okay. All right. Okay. It's been moved by uh, Commissioner Ferguson, seconded by Dana Pruz. You're not even going to be here. You can't second it. Is there anything else we can postpone to the 19th? Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, we need it. You're not even going to be here. Take that back. I, I can second it. I can second it, Madam Chair. Well, you can if you want, but you know it's a little disingenuous. All right, it's been moved. It's been moved by Commissioner Ferguson, seconded by Dana Cruz. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, the Chugach Access Plan has been moved to November nineteenth. All right. Does that include the work session, the second work session you wanted as well on that plan? Uh, let me see the schedule for a minute. I, I think it would be great to have it before then if it was on the schedule. Um, unless, the Chugach Access it, Plan is on the schedule for the fifth, for November fifth. Also, oh, and Bruce, you'd want to be a part of the work session too. I would right. Think. Yes, you're not going to be here on the fifth either. All right. I'm sorry. What? I can't make it on the fifth. You can't make it on the fifth. Um, the 12th is Veterans Day. Yes. The 12th is Veterans Day. Day. Your chairman will be in Hawaii. We're not meeting. <laughs> I make a motion. We move to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, move the meeting to Hawaii. All right. Okay. Well, um, I think the work session should be on the 19th as well. All right. You want a motion for me on that? <laughs> no, I want to go home. All right. Okay. All right. So that's it. I'm sorry. What are you going to do? All right. Um, before we adjourn, uh, Commissioner Ferguson, do you have any report on Title 21 and the actions of the Assembly Subcommittee? I'm not comfortable with what's going on. We're not doing well. Uh, I don't think our points are being properly considered. Um, and I'm not happy. Where are you? In, where, where is the, I have not been able to attend the last uh, two or three weeks. Where are we on uh, what uh, chapter? We are, 
uh, going to complete the loose ends on chapter 7, which unfortunately I don't find out until Wednesday afternoon, usually just before I send out my email, exactly what that means. Um, they want input on the chapter 14 definitions, even though I sent that in quite a while ago, but I can't find my copy because I've changed computers and, um, on that one. And so, um, but that's where we are, and I don't know if we have resolution on the order of precedence. Um, I sent out, for the lack of Bruce's last comments to everybody, um, I don't know where that is going. Um, I'm concerned that we are not at the table on that issue. Um, but I, but if, I, if I were to know when the issue is going to come up, I can probably be there. Bruce, if I, you will know within three minutes of me knowing. That's my problem. Yeah. And it's not coincidental, I think, at times. I, mean, I, I felt ambushed. I really did. And I expressed my displeasure, and it did us no good. Um, Maybe we should double our pay. Well, I'm not quite sure how best to manage that situation. I appreciate all of your efforts. Um, I'll try to have a conversation with Debbie Osiander, get a little better idea. I think they're almost done with their meetings, aren't they? I've been thinking we've always been done with our meetings for about a month. Okay. Um, issues that I thought were resolved to our satisfaction before seem to keep coming up. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your continued efforts um, regarding that matter. Any other comments or ideas or suggestions at this particular point in time? When I send out an email like I did on Bruce's, if I don't get a comment back, I assume that at the negotiating table I can try to get the best deal I can. That's why I'm doing it. I mean, I don't think I can sit there as a singular commissioner and if I don't send the question out or if, I, if I've got time and I don't send it out, then that's shame on me. But if I have time, I'll send it out and I would like your input. Um, well, I think the best thing that we can do is we all have specific areas of expertise and if we can get an idea of what the schedule is going to be and what the agenda is, then people that, the commissioners that have the interest and the time in a specific issue can try to um, attend, attend those meetings. Um, all right. Um, is there anything, any other um, issues? Um, I want to, um, at the uh, suggestion of myself, um, Jerry Weaver has agreed to reinstall the monthly luncheon meetings. I feel that there are a lot of issues that are coming before the Commission um, that um, could be more informally discussed with the Director in a luncheon meeting. So I would encourage all of you to attend and put on your calendar the October 18th meeting, which is down in City Hall. Um, on the fourth floor, I think, or the fifth floor, on the fifth floor in one of the conference rooms. So please mark your calendars and see um, if you can uh, attend that meeting. And then those meetings are scheduled through November and through December as well. So, I'm sorry, what? Uh, actually, they provide lunch. Yeah, it's a luncheon. They provide lunch from Choffee's downstairs. They have really good sandwiches and potato salad. So, huh? Yeah, I'm talking you into it. All right. I think they have desserts, too. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. I would entertain them. Yes. Just reminding everybody to keep your packets for the historic preservation plan and for the Golden View right. Road project issues. And if for some reason you lose them or misplace them, please let us know. And we'll see what we can do to assist with replacement. 
All right, very good. Now, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, Dana Pruz and Stacey Dean, thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.